this is Len Carden, and I'm the chair of the Arlington School Committee. Um, we are doing a remote meeting. Um, uh, this open meeting is being conducted remotely consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12th, 2020, due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth due to the outbreak of the COVID-19 virus. In order to mitigate the transmission of the COVID-19 virus, we have been advised and directed by the Commonwealth to suspend public gatherings and as such, the governor's order suspends the requirement of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location uh, and we are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. The um, order is included with the agenda materials, um, which you can find on the town website. Um, we are being, this Arlington School Committee meeting is being convened by uh, Zoom telephone conference, video conference, and also uh, is being broadcast by ACMI. Um, please note that this meeting is being recorded and uh, the panelists, you're all on video uh, unless you turn it off so uh, everyone can see that. Uh, and also if you, if you screen share, they will see what's on your screen. Um, on to the ground rules, we will take turns speaking. Um, uh, I don't have my list in order, so I'm just gonna go on, <laughs> on how you arrange on my screen this time, folks. So. Uh, um, uh, as we go through and also for roll call votes. Um, uh, for items with public comment, um, uh, we will, I will unmute you um, and allow you to speak. Um, if you did join, um, uh, if you are, if you did join by Zoom, if you are able to get in by Zoom and, and and want to be seen, then then I can we can work on that. But um, presumably, I think it's enough just for us to be able to hear you. Um, the first thing actually tonight is our annual school choice hearing, public hearing. Um, this is something that we're required to do uh, under Massachusetts law. If we um, uh, vote to approve school choice, then um, uh, we participate in their program. If we do not, then we continue which is what our policy has been for the past many, many years, um, then we will uh, not participate in the program. So can I get a motion to open the public hearing on school choice? I'll move. Second. All right. Uh, I guess we need a roll call. Oh, yes, Dr. Allison Ampey. You're on, don't, oh. don't we have to take attendance of the meeting first? Uh, sure, yes. That's right, sorry. I skipped that. Uh, just to confirm that everybody is, that members are present, um, uh, let's go ahead and make sure, respond that you can hear me and uh, uh, can participate. Mr. Thielman. Here. Uh, Dr. Allison Ampey. Here. Ms. Morgan. Here. Ms. Seuss? Here. Mr. Hayner? Here. Mr. Schlickman? Present. And from the administrative team, uh, Dr. Bodie? Here. Dr. McNeil? Here. Mr. Spiegel? Here. Ms. Elmer? Here. Mr. Mason? Here. And uh, we also have uh, Ms. Fitzgerald who is taking the minutes and Mr. Levy from the AEA. Are you still, yeah. out, still with us? Yes. yes. Great, thanks. Karen, yeah. yep. Karen's here, great. Yeah. All right, thank you. Okay, so back to the uh, motion to open the school choice public hearing. Uh, we'll go through the roll call, Mr. Thielman. You're on mute. Here. Here. Mm -hmm. Here. Yes. You want to say yes to, yes. to vote? Yes. 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 Dr. Allison Ampey. Yes. Ms. Morgan. Yes. Ms. Seuss. Yes. Mr. Hayner. Yes. Mr. Schuckman. Yes. And I'm also yes. All right. Uh, Ms. Fitzgerald, do we have any comments or any requests to speak about uh, school choice? No, we do not. Okay. 
uh, just to be extra sure, we're not supposed to use the chat for any substantive issues, but for um, uh, any technical issues as we have been. Um, uh, and uh, for this purposes, if there's anyone who, uh, who is on the chat that wants to speak to this issue, um, please let me know. All right, are there any school committee members that need to speak, would like to speak to this issue? Mr. Shukran. Uh, oh, you just muted yourself. Let me I, I'm prepared to make the motion once we uh, end the hearing. Great, thank you. Uh, move to close the public hearing. Is there a second? Dr. Allison Ampey? I'll second. second. All right, any further discussion? Mr. Thielman? Yes. Uh, people moved around. <laughs> Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. Ms. Seuss? Uh, yes. Mr. Hainer? Yes. Ms. Morgan? Yes. Mr. Schlickman? Yes. And I'm also yes. Sorry, Karen, I will, I will write down everybody's order now as they sit at the table so I can uh, uh, do this correct going forward. Thank you. All right. Mr. Shukman, did you wanna make the motion about school choice? Uh, yes, I do. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I move that we withdraw from the state school choice program for the 2020-21 school year and notify the uh, Department of Elementary and Secondary Education that we are doing so due to a lack of uh, space in the district. Second. Thank you. Um, we'll go through just uh, if there's any discussion. Um, Mr. Hayner. I have nothing to add. Dr. Ellis Nampi. Um, I just want to point out that this school choice is talking about people coming in from other towns into our district, um, not going to um, from one elementary school here in Arlington or not. That's Great. Um, Ms. Seuss? Uh, nothing to add. Mr. Thielman? Nothing to add. Mr. Shukman? Ms. Morgan? All right. And so roll call vote, Mr. Mr. Hainer. Yeah, uh, yes. Dr. Allison Ampey. Yes. Ms. Seuss. Yes. Mr. Thielman. Yes. Mr. Schuckman. Yes. Ms. Morgan. Yes. And I'm also yes. All right, thank you. So our next item is um, public comment. Um, I don't know if Adam was able to join. Does not seem like that. There was one other person who dialed in the 617 number. Is this someone, is Adam who wanted to, part, to, to participate in public participation on the phone line? Unfortunately not, okay. So, uh, Lynette Martin, um, you were on the 781 number, I believe. Hi, yes. All right. Do, do you, um, go ahead. You I participated, your... yeah. I participated yesterday uh, listening to the meeting on um, community outreach. So I was happy to hear that um, you're moving forward with trying to schedule some uh, parent forums, which I think is good. I would just like to reiterate that I, I like uh, um, Jennifer Seuss's suggestion that you um, return to having school chats online because I feel the community really is looking for a place to speak. Um, and the listening session that I hosted, I sent the notes to the school committee it was very constructive. Everybody was really engaged and had uh, lots of good feedback on what their experiences are. But I appreciate that um, 
you wanted to wait a week or so until the uh, new program is underway. Um, but also, um, I know that um, you said it falls under day-to-day -day operations, uh, but as a policy to consider for when we're having distance learning, I'd like to suggest that the school committee consider um, advocating for a policy where there are scheduled uh, parent-teacher type conferences to determine what each family needs since they're going to be very different needs so that the, the teachers have an understanding of what's going on in the homes. I know even for myself and we come from you know a privileged family with kids that are you know um, that are engaged um, there I think talking to a teacher would help sort of tailor what we're doing moving forward and an understanding of like where we're struggling techno technologically technologically. Um, so I hope that that'll be something that's discussed by the district moving forward, as well as um, looking into whether or not we can look at the budget to get more technology help, um, because that's also been um, difficult for my family and I imagine others. Um, there's currently a Google form, but it's sort of hard to get to it when you're um, stuck, you know, when you're having a computer problem and your kid's trying to access it. It would be great if there was a phone number or an email address that we could do directly as opposed to a Google form, which is sort of harder to access and get through. Um, so those are just some things that I wanted to bring to the forefront. Thank you for the time. Great, thank you. All right. Um, so again, I'm gonna give people an opportunity um, who did join and are able to access the chat um, to state if they do want to do want to participate in public participation. Not seeing anyone else, and I do not see that Adam has joined us. So unfortunately, we will follow up with him and and uh, ask for his uh, comments by email. All right, so our next item is um, our Rainbow Commission appointment. Um, uh, and I believe Keith has joined us. Keith, I am going to um, allow you to speak. And actually I can. Um, Jennifer, do you wanna introduce him? Uh, sure. So um, the Rainbow Commission is uh, was established, I think, two years ago. So it's relatively recent. Um, and the school committee has one appointee. Um, our previous appointee, Anna Watson, who is fabulous, um, had to step down for personal reasons. And so we issued a call. Um, didn't get actually a lot of applicants, but Keith is actually a great person. He's an educator from Burlington. Um, an art educator. Um, he's done a lot of sort of engagement at his district there and, and other personal things. Um, and I just think he'd be a great asset. Uh, we, we actually met community relations months ago to, to <laughs> recommend him, but for various reasons, um, he wasn't able to be sort of brought to the full committee until now. So I, I'd like to recommend him to the full committee. Great, thank you. Um... And Keith, I did promote you to panelist if you if you want to join by video, but we don't need you to. Um, do you just want to um, you know say a couple words about why you responded to the invitation? Sure, I can unmute myself. Right. There you go. Hi, hi everybody. Um, thank you for yeah. joining us. Oh, thank you for having me. Um, I'm just I'm really excited about this to be involved in it. I've lived in Arlington for about four years and I really love this community. And uh, this is a cause that's really close to my heart, especially with um, kids and teenagers, but also with adults as well. And I had my first meeting um, kind of to see what it was like um, a few weeks ago with the Rainbow Commission. And I'm really looking forward to the great work that uh, the people in Arlington do. And I'm happy to be a part of this community. So I, I thank you very much for including me and for recommending me to the commission. Okay. Great. Great. Um, I'd like to make a motion to recommend Keith to the Rainbow Commission as the school committee appointee. Second. All right. Is there any further discussion? Anybody can just wave this time. 
Yes, Mr. Shukman. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and Keith, I just want to uh, welcome you. Thank you for serving. Noting that you have one of the most typographically attractive resumes I've ever seen. It, it is a work of art, and I appreciated that, the quality of your presentation. Well, thank you. I was a graphic designer before I became a teacher, so I appreciate that. <laughs> All right, anybody else? You can just wave if you need to talk. All right, so we'll go through the roll call vote. Um, Mr. Hayner. Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey. Yes. Ms. Seuss. Uh, yes. Mr. Thielman. Yes. Mr. Schluckman. Yes. Ms. Morgan. Yes. And I am also yes. And just to, uh, I just want to thank you, uh, Keith, for your service. And uh, just to let you know that you should feel free to come back to the school committee um, at some point to sort of report on your work and anything has to do, especially with kids. Um, I think the committee would love to know. Absolutely, Great. thank you. Great, thank you very much for serving. Oh, Mr. Hayner, yes, go ahead. Uh, just to follow up on what uh, Ms. Seuss just said, I think it would behoove the committee to have each one of our appointees or as a group, if we have more than one, on a regular basis, maybe monthly, for, to an annual report, not just wait if there's a crisis or something big coming up, so we can stay inform, informed and ahead of the game. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Great, thank you. All right, any further discussion? All right, thank you, Keith. Thanks. Okay, the uh, next item is, um, the COVID-19 update. Um, so Dr. Bodhi, most of this is going to be for you. Um, uh, we have a couple of items listed, but you know, feel free to uh, start and you know where you want as long as we, we cover those issues. Um, uh, it may make sense to give a break um, for questions uh, from the committee after you go over the survey, um, after you go over the latest updates um, and at other times that you think appropriate. So, uh, or if you see somebody waving like this. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, you'll have to tell me if you see somebody waving. I like will. That. I'll, I'll, I'll watch out for it for you. All right. Um, well, good evening, everyone. Uh, we certainly a week is more than a week has passed since we received the news from Governor Baker that uh, schools are going to be closed for the remaining part of this year. I think it was um, uh, certainly uh, disappointing to the district and sure to parents as well. Uh, we would have loved to have had our students return. But as I said in the letter I sent out to parents last night, you know, I know how important it is that uh, we all do our part to make sure that the, uh, the spread of this virus um, remains more contained. Um, we've had some, we've had some as a district I wouldn't say that we knew that we were going to be closed, but we suspected that might be a possibility a couple of weeks ago. And we've actually started to make some plans um, uh, along the lines of what would be essential standards that we might need to uh, teach before the end of the school year. So over the, over the last week, uh, one of the things we wanted to, to learn more about was the experience of our families as well as our staff. And we sent out a survey and we had a remarkable um, turnout uh, for both of both surveys. So I want to do my report in a couple ways. We're first going to start giving um, an overview of the survey results from parents. And then I'm going to give an overview of what our plan is going, uh, going forward. Um, and, and part of that will also be an addressing special education uh, because there, there's certainly been a lot of directives around special education from the Department of Education over the last uh, last few weeks. So um, to give the presentation on the survey results, I'm gonna ask Dr. McNeil to do that. Okay. Um, good evening, everyone. I I'm going to have to share my screen uh, in order to provide uh, access so everybody can view the slide deck that I'm going to use in order to report out the results from the parent guardian uh, school closure survey. 
Okay, so I don't know if I have to get permission because when I go to share a screen, I get a message, host disabled attendee screen sharing. All right, let me see if I can put you up there, Rod, okay? Okay. I might have to share it from my device. Okay. Host disabled participants screen sharing. Hmm. I think we're all going to be technologically savvy in a year from now. Yeah, I think I, think, yes, I think I just are. changed it. Yeah, I think I just changed it under options. Can, we, can you try again, Dr. McNeil? Sure. Okay, yes, it works now. Thank you. Sure. So can everybody see my screen? Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Perfect. So um, as I stated, as uh, Dr. Bodie stated last Friday, uh, we sent out two surveys, one to our APS parents and guardians and one out to our district staff. So the survey results that, I'm, that I will be sharing tonight are from the parent guardian um, school closure survey. And then I will also interject uh, certain highlights from the staff uh, survey that align with some of the questions and uh, will help to illuminate some of the points um, that we received back from the parent guardians survey. So the objective of the survey uh, for the presentation is to communicate the results uh, of the APS parent guardian closure survey to the public. Uh, I'm going to also review some of the highlights of the survey and then you'll see the various uh, graphs that have been constructed in order to share the information in an organized and readable format. And then I'll be able to respond to uh, comments or questions at the end. So um, just to give an overview, we had uh, 3,187 parents uh, uh, respond to the survey. And I do want to add that the, the it was sent out via Google form and parents had the opportunity to submit a form for every child in their household because we understood that some of the experiences may vary based upon the needs of the child. And uh, we just wanted to make sure we were getting a very clear picture of, of everyone's experience. Uh, the majority of the respondents answered that they have the proper number of devices to access the activities uh, provided by classroom teachers. Uh, and I think that was also due to our uh, Chromebook distribution. Uh, respondents indicated that um, having flexibility is in, in timing is an important element for us to consider as we move forward in our remote learning plan. Uh, most respondents indicated that their child is currently completing one to two hours of activities. Uh, most respondents also indicated that they are receiving the proper amount of information from the district. And uh, finally, most respondents answered student motivation as a challenge for students not completing the activities provided by classroom teachers. Uh, so these are just some of the major highlights that I noticed. As I go through the slides, there might be other things that um, individuals notice. So I just wanted to identify these to begin. So this, uh, and I'm not gonna talk extensively at each for each slide, I'll just, you know, touch upon some important points, but this just gives you an overview of who responded um, and where uh, the students um, go to the schools from the families that responded. Uh, and this gives an overview of the grade levels that were represented in the survey. And this slide, uh, and, and I also want to direct everyone to, I also put in each slide, not everybody responded to every prompt or question. So based upon uh, a, a situation or what pertained to each child, that's why some people did not respond to certain um, prompts. So this one, we had 757 responses. Uh, and this is just asking about the, uh, if, a, if a child is on an IEP, 504. So we wanted to be able to disaggregate the data based upon that. Uh, on what the child's, uh, what type of support uh, 
uh, various respondents, uh, the children of various respondents were receiving. Um, and this one I, I do want to touch upon because it does talk to this to what modes of communication are, are viewed as most successful. And you'll see that the live video sessions with the classroom teachers and Google Classroom, which is a mode that we use to push out activities and assignments to students. Um, those are the two most popular ways that were viewed as being most successful uh, with communication and receiving activities. Uh, this slide was interesting as well as again, we had 3,170 responses to this question uh, that asked, uh, is your child able to engage in the recommended time? So that three hours and three and a half hours for high school, the three hours for K through eight, those are recommendations from the state. Um, and that's what, that is our target for our remote learning plan as we uh, design the activities. And it's not just the core content areas, it's also includes specials, electives, so that we can make sure we're addressing the whole child. Uh, this uh, is a follow-up question to the previous question because it's asking what are some of the challenges if they answered no, um, what, what are people saying about the um, challenges that's why students are not completing uh, the activities are not able to. And as you can see, student motivation was the was the primary reason. Uh, in this slide, we talked about uh, this asking how many hours. Uh, and you can notice that uh, most uh, students are completing about one to two hours of activities on a daily basis. So that gives us a benchmark on, on things that we need to consider as we go forward in our remote learning plan. Um, this uh, is how you would characterize the communication. And we were trying to see the ways that we're communicating the information. Are we being successful? And uh, based upon the remarks, um, it seems that we're being moderate to high success with our communication. So as we move forward, this is something that we can also consider. Um, I think this one, uh, this, this, sir, this question is just asking us you know, the amount of communication, where are we with the, the amount that, we're, that uh, individuals are receiving from the district and the middle, you know, because most people responded to three, I think I'm interpreting that as that they're receiving the, the correct amount of information. Uh, this lets us know what the concern is as it relates to uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and how people are handling it and the stress level. So it kind of gives an idea um, of the stress level in each household as it relates to that and their concern. Uh, this is letting us know, again, as I uh, mentioned at the beginning, that most uh, parents are indicating that they do have a sufficient number of digital devices within their household for their child or children to access the activities. And this uh, slide right here, and this is you know, an, a, a piece of information that we can disaggregate by grade level, but uh, we're looking at um, how many, how much support are parents saying that their students need. And this is something that we would definitely disaggregate to, to determine like, you know, is it at the elementary level, is it the, at the high school level? So this will let us know um, at what level we need to consider as we're designing the, our activities. Uh, and just again, I, I spoke at the beginning that the flexibility of timing is one of the most, uh, is one of the things that um, people want us to focus on as we move forward with our remote learning plan. Uh, this one is what are the, some of the key areas that, you know, uh, parents want us to focus on as we move forward in our remote learning plan, academics and preparation for next year, connection uh, with, te with teachers and peers are all, you know, actually the academics and connection with teachers and peers were the highest, but also people are concerned about being, their children being prepared for next year. Uh, this slide is talking about, um, I, I wanted to see how Google Translate, um, you know, how effective it is for our uh, families who their preferred language is not English. So are they being able to, are they able to translate the information that they're receiving? 
And this slide um, only had, you know, very little, very few people responded to this. And I don't know if it's because of the language barrier, but uh, I wanted to know if you, if we all wanted to know if, you know, the Google Translate was not something that was, that they were viewing as effective, what are the languages that we need to make sure we pay attention to? And so this overall just gives us an idea of, of what people are dealing with within their individual households. This slide is giving us that information. And as you can see at the top of the list, um, you can't see it because it's cut off, but the first one is a, a person with the underlining condition um, and then unemployment. Those are the two highest uh, concerns uh, throughout the uh, district uh, for, for our families. And then, you know, it goes down the list and, and there's also uh, some individual responses that uh, let us know that um, our parents and guardians and members of our community are dealing with some very serious issues. So I think this is definitely something that we need to take into consideration as we move forward um, and try to make sure that we're, we're providing a balance uh, for our families and that we're, we're considering the equity piece of, of how we're pushing out um, our activities and assignments. So our next steps is that we're gonna um, use the data from the parent guardian survey to uh, develop the next phase of the district's remote learning plan. Uh, the data will continue to be disaggregated by uh, the building and district administrators and then district personnel are developing the next phase of the district's uh, remote learning plan, which will use the state's recent uh, updated guidelines and curriculum standards as a foundation for moving forward. And the goal is to advance the curriculum so that we prepare our students for um, the next phase of learning and also to make sure that we're using the key standards uh, and identifying the ones that we have not covered over the year and then the ones that are critical to advance that learning uh, at each level. So I can open it up for comments and questions and I will stop sharing my screen as well. Or do you want me to keep the slideshow up for during the comments and questions? I'm gonna to refer to it in my questions. Okay. Okay, so if you just let me know, I can go to a particular slide if you, if you would like. All right, sure. Uh, Mr. Hainer, why don't we go in order to start? I've got a couple of questions. It was that last, uh, slow down. It was the last slide that you talked oh, about. Oh, the last one? Okay, sorry. But the, the one that had all the experiences? Yes. The, right there. Uh, what I'd like to suggest, less than a question, is that it's on our website and in all our communication that we provide parents with uh, whatever web page we have in the town to get uh, things of uh, food security, health, things of this nature. We're concerned with it. Just let them know that if we can connect with the town link, the town has a lot of support facilities. So in our communication with that. The other one was, and I saw just a small number uh, not having Wi-Fi capability. Um, mm -hmm. My understanding is that the town will provide for it freely or ACMI or somebody will provide that freely uh, for them. So we should be able to eliminate that piece of it. And my last question, basically, and may go to the, the slides here, or I, maybe it's to be deferred to the, the next section on remote learning. Work that is sent to the, uh, the kids and things of that nature. Do the teachers check it over? Is there uh, feedback to the students? And when a student doesn't do his or her work, if there is that feedback or it's not done correctly, uh, or they're not doing their work, are we informing the parents? So that's a very good question. Um, and this is something that we've been doing since the inception of school closure. So I think that at the first phase of our remote learning plan, we wanted to make sure that, you know, we were worried about, you know, everybody's social emotional well-being, making sure that they had the various uh, things that they need in order to progress academically and to also make sure that we're checking in with our families. And in doing so, we also, so part of that check-in was, you know, as, as teachers reach out uh, synchronously to the different, to the, the students on their caseload and, and class list, 
the ones that they were not able to make contact with, you know, they were, you know, you, we were taking the time to make sure that we were reaching out and involving uh, social workers and counselors in order to follow up, in order to see how those students were doing. And then the enrichment activities, uh, for the enrichment activities, the classroom teachers were identifying and trying to encourage students to hand in their assignments. And then when they did, they re did receive feedback. When we go into this next phase, we're gonna just be a little bit more structured. And so that, you know, one thing from the curriculum and instruction department, I've, I've made sure that the curriculum leaders know that when they're designing the lessons and they're identifying the activities to explicitly identify those activities that students will need to turn in to receive feedback. And these activities will be aligned with the key understandings that need to be addressed to move forward. Just a quick follow up. Will is, and I, I don't mean to overburden the teachers or the administration, but periodic feedback to the parents as well, that the children are doing well or need some extra support or something like that. I don't know whether an email or something. Absolutely. We, we definitely wear, um, you know, it's warranted and we're definitely keep uh, parents up to date as to how students are doing especially right. the ones who are not engaging those are the ones that we're also targeting to make sure that we're reaching out to the to the families the parents in order to see what we need to do to support uh the engagement for those students great thank you mm -hmm. great uh, thank you uh dr allison ampey Hi, uh, Dr. McNeil, thank you for this report. I'm hoping that we'll get a copy of the survey um, and the survey results uh, to look at in terms of the questions and stuff. I didn't write, I, I didn't make a copy of the questions as I took the survey and, and I regretted it afterwards. Um, two things about this. One, I think there was a lot of quibbling about or uh, grumbling um, that the survey was done in such a time limited fashion, um, especially without putting the information that it was going to be on a very short timeline in the email that was sent out. Um, second, uh, I think there's a few things. I didn't think there was a question asked about internet um, access. There was a question about devices, um, but if, internet access was not assessed, that is something that we should be asking about. So, um, to I the saw first, devices, I right. didn't see. So th this question was a precursor. So we asked, is your child able to engage in three hours? And then the next one, um, if you looked at the options that were available oh, yeah. for people to check off, it's lack of Wi-Fi and internet. And from the individuals of the 1,632 responses to this prompt, only eight people uh, indicated that the reason why their kids cannot participate is due to a lack of Wi-Fi or internet. Okay. I'm just concerned. Okay, I appreciate that, yes, you did kind of check it it's buried um and i think given the other concerns i raised that it's not as clear that someone who actually has problems with wi-fi and and our internet is going to be answering this survey fast enough to i mean to actually get an answer in but um one other thing I was concerned about is that there wasn't anything about um, asking how satisfied parents were with how school has been going up until now. Um, and I think from what I'm hearing on social media and other places, that is something that uh, would have been nice to have numbers on. Um, it's my sense is that people are not, have not been really happy with how it's going and, and it'd be useful to know how it's 
what their satisfaction has been with what we had been doing and then hopefully it's going to increase with what we're pivoting to um, next week. So that's my comments. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, just want to note to participants that the chat is only to be used for technical issues. Um, for open meeting law reasons, we cannot have um, chats going on with uh, members of the committee uh, during an open meeting, um, unless there are technical issues. Um, so we're not ignoring you, but we actually should not be looking at um, your comments, unfortunately, um, under the open meeting law. Uh, Ms. Seuss, you're next. Uh, yes, hi. Um, so a couple of things. One is that I note that 74% of the respondents say that students are spending less than two hours a day on activities. And one thing I think this survey sort of missed, right, so there's this slide, but then if you look at how, how much time people are spending, it mm -hmm. comes out to 74% doing less than two hours. So one thing I think that the survey missed um, in asking why that is, it assumed that there were some barriers like motivation or something, but what I'm hearing from parents almost universally is there just isn't that much work given. It's you know not required work, not optional work, not suggested activities. There just isn't enough that would fill out three hours in a day or three and a half hours in a day. So I wish we had sort of asked that in the survey because I think that would have been helpful. Um, but then another comment, um, so just to, to let people know that, that um, I mean, you've, you've gone through this, but there, there are sort of a new set of recommendations from the Department of Education, um, that, uh, which is why uh, things will look very differently in the next uh, couple of months or month and a half. Um, the recommendations so far up until now had been to um, only cover established content and a, and a bunch of other things. So it's just sort of, so there's another level and this is why um, things are gonna look very different. Um, and I wanna note that one thing that that um, rec current recommendation is, has stressed very heavily that engagement with students is very high priority um, and that they recommend very heavily that that engagement be synchronous. So, so while you know, essential learning shouldn't happen synchronously, I mean, people are looking for um, a lot of flexibility in that, that, they, that the, the 25 page document that sort of laid out the recommendations, gave it a whole bunch of different sort of recommendations for a check-in or an office hour or something that is, is synchronous as an engagement perspective, not as a content level um, work. But, but that is now the, the current, but very new <laughs> recommendation from the Department of Education. Yes, and I just wanna comment that um, your view of the daily activities and um, the amount of time we view that the same thing. We, we saw that and mm -hmm. that is gone into how we have moved forward with our plan. Mm -hmm. And I also, that's why I also want to emphasize that, um, you know, when you look at, I don't know, and this is one thing that we're trying to make sure we, we're, we're very uh, cognizant, of, cognizant of, is that the synchronous or asynchronous communication we're using the asynchronous method for trying to push lessons out. The synchronous, you know, contacts will focus on the social, emotional, and making connections with students. Right. We are emphasizing that as we move forward, and Dr. Bodie will speak to that as she talks about the next phase of our remote learning plan. But in the design of the lessons, we did take into consideration that information. We do, we are viewing it the same way you are. That we're trying to get to that three hours, and that's why I also added when I got to this slide that we're not just talking about content area. We're not just talking about, you know, in, you know reading, writing, uh, math and science and social studies, but we're also making sure that the community knows that when you receive an art project or a, uh, you know, some physical activities, um, you know, physical activities from the uh, physical education teachers that focus on certain skills. And then you also have music that it also should be incorporated into um, that three, three and a half hours determination. So uh, we're also trying to make sure we have a nice balance between academic 
physical activity and creative uh, aspects that can be offered by our elective. So I just wanna make sure that we point that out and we, we have taken that in consideration. So mm -hmm. I just wanna support what you're saying that I agree with you that we need to make sure what we're looking at as we're designing our activities to be very specific about making sure that it's filling up that we're meeting that guidelines of three and three and a half hours at the high school level. And, and yes, we also are going to start, you know, we, we looked at the survey and we saw that parents identified as the synchronous connections through the Google Live Hangouts meet as very successful and mm -hmm. something that they want more of. So that's where we're also going to emphasize that as well. Great. So thank you for your comments. And I just wanted to, to assure you that we have, we're seeing that the same way that you're viewing it as well. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Uh, Mr. Thielman. Yeah, uh, thanks very much uh, <clears throat> for the survey. The, um, I would, we're on the slide that I had the question on. We, you don't have a breakdown of, uh, of more than three and a half hours, three hours, or you know, the 74% the, the that are, what is it, less than? Uh, less than two. Less than two, less than two hours. You don't, you don't have a breakdown of that by, any other, by grade? Do you have a breakdown of that by grade? I do have a way of uh, disaggregating the data by grade level. And yeah. you know, we are looking at that. As I said before, the building principals and the district level administrators are disaggregating that data yeah. um, and our curriculum leaders. So again, we're, we're looking at this information and we're using it as we plan and design lessons moving forward. At yeah. the same time, we are also taking into consideration that we don't want kids to be, you know, you know, we want to balance between like activities and like, and, and, you know, looking at a screen as well. So we're trying to make sure that when we design our lessons and our activities, that there's a balance of projects, you yeah. know, individual assignments that don't require staring at a screen. Yeah. Um, no, fair enough. I think that's a, I mean, the other thing is I look at this chart, um, I mean, I suspect a lot of the students are doing more than three and a half hours. Uh, maybe it's, I mean, it's hard to disaggregate that, are, are most uh, motivated students in the district. Um, although I, you know, I have no way, we have no way of knowing that, but I assume that there's a lot of, a lot, a lot of those who are doing more than three, three and a half hours probably are our uh, most motivated students. Would you do you think that's probably true or you have no way of knowing? Well, you know, that's, that is hard to, to really understand mm -hmm. that dynamic of it. But, you know, we, we, we want to make sure that, you know, the, you know, the assignments, like we're looking at like 20 to 30 minutes per content area too. Yeah. So we want to make sure that it's a balance over disciplines and content areas. And so, you know, if a student is going through their assignment, I mean, you have to also understand like when you're in class, we have like cooperative grouping. There's a lot of discussion that's going on. There's dialogue. Uh, so, you know, some of that is that element is taken out of it. So, you know, some of our students may get, you know, some activities and are able to, to complete the activities in a short amount of time. So therefore we're also adding like enrichment activities that can go along with that act, the activity that was assigned for that day or for that week that students can also engage, engage in engage in and also support what they're doing that can help uh, fulfill that three hour um, suggestion. Yeah. So, so we're also making sure that we're pushing these out through Google Classroom yeah. at the, you know, and so that that's where, you know, we can get feedback from teachers and students and we can just con continue to tweak this as we move along. And I think that's also the message I would like everyone to understand. Like we're, this is something that we're, you know, we were hit with and as we've moved through the weeks, we're collecting information and we're tweaking what we're doing and we're trying to make sure that we're meeting the goals that have been um, outlined by the state. But it's been a learning process. You know, it's, it's, you know, if you think about this, a lot of our teachers were trained to deliver instruction based upon being in session. And now we have to learn a brand new way of delivering instruction in a remote learning environment. So you know, within a, a short amount of time. So we're trying to make sure that we are using the information and, you know, learning 
and continually to, to improve upon what we're doing. Yeah, no, well, thank you, Rod, and thanks for this. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that you're taking the, the, the data from the parent survey and you're layering it onto all the data you have inside the district in terms of the number of students Absolutely. that are in Google Hangouts. And because yes. you know, if you kind of study at grade, grade level by grade level, Correct. And, you know, academic level, especially at the high school, I'm sure you're seeing trends in terms of the number of students participating based on levels in the high school, for sure. Absolutely. And I just want everybody to know that we're continuing to use this data and we're going to continue to learn from that data. Yep. And we're going to continue to tweak and improve upon what we're doing. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I had a, a couple comments on that. Um, we have been talking with principals about the level of student engagement. One, one, there's two ways you can look at it. You can look at it from the number of students that synchronously go on Google, Google Hangout Meet. And you can also look at it from the perspective of what percentage of students actually turn in assignments every week Absolutely. and get feedback. Mm -hmm. And they're different. Uh, we have a much higher percentage of students that are actually participating in Google Classroom and getting assignments in. And those percentages have been going up. Um, I, I know that just for one, one grade level example, eighth grade, the percentages are some, sometimes um, anywhere from 75 to 90% of the students. So that's a great uh, percentage. I, obviously, we'd love it to be closer to 100, if not 100. But the number of students that are synchronously going in Hangout uh, can be less and vary by, uh, by, by grade. I will say that one of the things that we were, um, we got a very strong turnout also in responses from staff. And if you take out on the question of how many times have you um, had Google Hangout during the week for students, and you take out those that are not applicable like bus drivers and secretaries, um, Ninety-four percent of the teachers in the last couple of weeks have been going and doing a hangout at least once. Seventy percent are two to five and five plus times. So it's it is definitely happening, but the turnout in hangout isn't as high as the as the submissions of work, which is interesting. Yes. Mm -hmm. So that's the intersection between the, uh, the staff survey results and the um, parent results. And we're trying to see, we're trying to calibrate that and then also emphasize that as we move forward, those synchronous uh, live uh, sessions. Great, thank you. Uh, Mr. Schlickman, you're up next. Thank you. Uh, for a quick survey that is being done in, uh, with a bunch of questions we're not experienced with. I thought this is well done. I share Dr. Allison Ampey's uh, desire to see the cross tabs because uh, I'm sure there's some really interesting information here. The other concern I have obviously is that when we're asking in English for issues of second language learners in a predominantly English format, <clears throat> Uh, prompted by an English uh, email, uh, we may be a little off on, on that. And uh, when we're asking if you're able to get online easily on the online format, uh, you know, that's uh, obviously going to be, be skewing the data on those questions as well. Uh, the only other question I have, which will be resolved if we get the uh, cross tabs, is on slide 20. Which was the, the next to last. Okay, I also want to say, like, um, it was stated I, that the questions that you see on the slides are the actual questions from the survey. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I just want to make sure if everybody has a copy of this, and I know that I sent one to Karen, and uh, so I know if, if you're able to have a copy of this uh, slide deck, you, these are all the actual questions. Yeah, sure. you know, the thing is, is that we're locked in here into this format and it's difficult enough to be looking at the Zoom and the slides and <laughs> right. with exactly. Uh, yeah. So it, that becomes a little more difficult. Mm -hmm. um, the usual papers and space that we have doesn't exist within the confines of the laptop. Right. Um, which which led me uh, uh, oh yeah on slide twenty um, 
just the slide cuts off the uh, the text of the uh, uh, the, the uh, prompt on the um, uh, on on the survey question, so that it reads a person with a blank. Uh, oh right, right. Okay, I see what you're saying. I okay. Yeah. I can I can try to so, so that would be helpful, um, but I, I've I've got to say that uh, you know this has been incredibly difficult times for everybody. We weren't set up to do this. We're not trained to do this. Uh, I'm watching partially on the other end as uh, my wife is teaching piano uh, and negotiating with students to set up times that don't conflict with schooling and parents' work schedules and. Um, Getting common time uh, within the course of the class is is is, a, is probably the biggest challenge that we're, we're seeing, and uh, I'm I'm very grateful for all the efforts of folks to to make connections with kids. I appreciate it, mm -hmm. and I appreciate everybody's uh, comments and uh, questions as well, because it, it definitely helps us to continue to think how we can um, evolve on what we're doing. Great, thank you. Uh, Ms. Morgan, you're next. Hi, so um, first of all, I, I think it's really important to acknowledge that, um, you know, while, you know, there may be imperfections with how the survey was administered or the tone or specifics of some of the questions potentially that we could, you know, look back on, I think the fact that this was sent out and that uh, input was solicited um, is really, um, should be really commended because I think that when you're doing something as a district or as a, as a administrative team that, you know, I think we can all feel sort of understandably uncomfortable with the position that we're in right now. Um, asking for feedback can be really hard. And so I'm, I'm really, really grateful that you all chose to do this. Um, so I have a couple of comments. I'm going to try and do my comments first and then do my questions at the end. So um, as others have said, you know, that I don't put a whole lot of stock in the data that we're getting about digital devices and Wi-Fi from a survey that had a limited opening period, was only accessible online. Um, I do know that at the Audison, um, Mr. Maringer and Ms. Murphy had initiated a plan where they were they were working on a sort of census 2020 system where they were looking to um, connect with every single student. And if you had a device and adequate internet, you were also asked to, to fill out the survey and then you were sort of dropped out of the, the pool of people that they were looking to connect with and presumably have whittled down that list to like a very small handful of students who, you know, still either don't have adequate devices or Wi-Fi. Um, and, and I know that as a district from what we've heard over the last six weeks that that has been something that you guys have been doing um, is sort of just, you know, eventually you're going to get you're going to connect with everybody, I would assume. Um, so I just I hope that that you know that that work continues. I'm sure that it does. Um, I'm I'm much more interested in the results of that outreach than I am in what we what we hear from a survey. Um, so the um, you know I I um, I wanted to touch on uh, Dr. Bodhi said that. It sounds like, and I, we, we don't have the slides, which is fine, but in the teacher survey, it sounds as though there were 6% of teachers who are not doing hangouts. Um, this is the 6% that responded to the survey and, and felt that it was appropriate to say they weren't doing hangouts. So I worry that that, you know, 6% is still pretty high um, to me if there are students out there, even in gen ed classes who have had no contact with their classroom or their teacher in, I, I, I have no idea how many weeks into this we are actually it's like it feels like a thousand six seven six I don't know a long really long time that really concerns me six percent is is really high um, especially if you think it might be higher than that because people didn't respond so um, I really hope we can get to a place where that's the expectation and that that's being delivered to our families they're obviously saying that it's really important so if that's not happening um, it, it's not been my experience with my children um, um, but you know that worries me. Um, 
to, to Dr. McNeil's point about the academic and elective time and the three hours and the three and a half hours, you know, I, I, I appreciate that. And I, I, I understand sort of macroscopically that the direction Jesse has been to do all of these pieces. I will say that as a, you know, as an educator and as a parent, I am far better able to serve my children's elective needs in art, music, physical education, outside, like I can't, I can, you know, I don't see there is, you know, with all due respect to our physical education teachers, I don't, I don't need necessarily those kind of assignments. I think it's fine that they're being provided, but um, the, you know, the academic piece is, is what as parents, it's really, really difficult to provide. So again, you know, I understand that three hours encompasses all of that. I appreciate the need for balance. I think that that's important. Um, but it's, um, you know, I, I also think there has to be an acknowledgement that our, our kids are far better able to meet their elective and uh, personal interests, uh, you know, uh, in their own time and, uh, you know, on their own than they are necessarily to meet their academic needs sometimes. So um, I had, actually, I think I'm down, oh no, I have two questions. So one of them, um, Dr. McNeil, I think is pretty straightforward. If you go back to the special education slide, it was very early on, two, three, four, I don't remember. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Mm, yes, this one. What do you have a sense of what other means if the following apply to your child? I, I understand what an IEP is. I understand what a 504 is. I understand what ELL support is. I understand substantially sub separate. Do you have any sense of what that 96 other group is? Yes. So uh, okay. the, the, the survey, yes. The answer is yes. Good. We, we could capture what the individual others are and they just come out. Um, and the reason why I put 96 on there is because these graphs will not allow me to put every single solitary type of so support. Was that like a type in answer? It was an individual response. Once you hit other on the uh, form, it allows you to type in an individual response. Got it. Okay. All right. Great. And so if we had some, would we have some access at some point to understand? I, I, I don't need specifics, obviously, to like students, but like I am curious, like 96 is a lot. I'm not totally clear what that group represents. I'm glad you guys know, because um, that's- Well, yeah, like people would, uh, yes. So the answer is yes. So people wrote in like, my child receives reading support or my child receives this, or, you know, uh, there's all different kinds of different support yeah. that we provide. And so that's why we wanted to make sure that we were being inclusive of, you know, you can't list all the things yeah, yeah, yeah. that kids are receiving. So that's why we encompass, we put other in there in order to encompass uh, that, re, that, um, uh, that, that desire to get that type of information. Thank you, that's super helpful. So I think the last, the last piece for me that has been, um, has been tricky and I've, I've talked to a lot of other parents is this whole notion of feedback right? What is feedback? How is feedback helpful? How does feedback drive engagement? You know, I work for a fully online university. Our classes are, you know, class in a can. We provide the course materials to our faculty and, and we are really paying our adjunct faculty to provide feedback to our students, right? That is the, that is the driving force towards student engagement and achievement. And, and that's what we pay, you know, in my, in my day job, that's what we pay people to do, right? Um, and so I I'm curious, you know, we're, we're, we're talking about feedback um, and that they're receiving feedback on one assignment per week. Um, and I'm curious what sort of administratively your vision is for what this feedback looks like. Understandably, it's different in first grade versus 12th grade or kindergarten. Um, but I, I, I have noticed in my conversations with families, in my own experiences, that you know, there, uh, there is a lot of inconsistency, obviously, um, but, but I don't know that there is a shared definition of feedback that is, is, is being, you know, being used and, and scaffolded by grade level across, the, um, across our schools. And I hope that that's something, you know, I'm sure that it's something that you guys are talking about. It's something that I hope that, um, that you talk about 
about more because it is, it's a huge driver towards this idea of engagement, right? That we're, we're looking to engage our students and we're looking for them to have, you know, both, um, you know, uh, uh, learning experiences along their path and then some sort of like formative, um, you know, and substantive feedback, you know, when they reach some kind of, you know, benchmark or standard. So um, I, I, I guess I'm, I'm curious, you know, to, for Dr. McNeil, for you, I, I, I suspect you have a, a strong sense of what feedback looks, sounds, and feels like, but I'm, I'm curious about how we're going to uh, work with all of our faculty to be able to do that for our students. Yes, yeah, so I mean, we've talked about feedback and the feedback that we provide, you know, as we, again, we're aligning the activities. And so to your point, moving forward, there's like before we were offering like a choice board. So parents will be receiving a lot more, we're being more prescriptive about it. So you will, you, and it will be more than just one assignment per week. So you will, uh, parents will be receiving, um, and it, it's gonna depend on, the, on the, the key understanding that we're trying to address. And so what is that going to look like moving forward? But the feedback will be able to give students an understanding of how they're um, progressing towards that key understanding. And so what needs to be um, still reviewed by that student. And so that's where the feedback will primarily uh, center on trying to advance the understanding for that particular student's ability to grasp that concept that we're trying to teach just as, we, as it would be, just as it, it would be when we're in session. So, I mean, perhaps maybe even a little bit more qualitative because it's going to be you know, some of the, most of the feedback is going to be from in a narrative form instead of like using a grade. So I, I'm very excited about the way that teachers are approaching this. And I think that the, the feedback that they provide on these uh, very, you know, these identified activities is going to be something that can lead our students forward. Okay, I guess, you know, I, I think that you speak articulately about it. I think that we as a, as a parent community, um, and 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 I still think you know even you know on the ground with the, the, the faculty who are delivering this, I think that we um, you know continue to need to be educated and engaged mm -hmm. in in what that means and and how it's effective for our students and and why you know if we have curriculum leaders who are producing curriculum materials, which I think is absolutely appropriate at this point. I don't think that every kindergarten teacher needs to prepare a science lesson. Um, but if you know if if a lot of this curriculum is being provided, especially K five, um, then then the efforts and energy of our of our teachers needs to be on providing feedback to students. Absolutely, absolutely. Right? And 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 I would say that we're not there yet. Right, which is okay. I mean, we're only like it, it feels like it's been a million years, but but we're not we're not at a place where we're providing, you know, robust, actionable, substantive feedback to students, and and it's really hard and it's super time consuming, and and you know, I hope that we. Um, you know, there are ways to provide, um, you know, Dreambox in math, for example, is a way to provide, like students are getting feedback, right? Mm -hmm. they, they're getting canned. It, and it, and it, again, it's, it's automatic, auto, it's automatically graded feedback, right? That they're getting on some of the things that they're doing. And I think that we can talk about the value of that, right? This like automatic feedback. I think that things like Google Forms or quizzes or whatever that can be done that provide students with auto-graded automatic feedback, I think is really useful. Um, and, and making sure that, you know, I mean, my preference is that my, you know, my kids' teachers and all of our kids' teachers are providing you know, the, the feedback that we can't get from a dream box, from a Google form, um, you know, from any of that work, you know, that's where, you know, they're the professionals, they're the subject matter experts. That's what we really, what I, I hope that we get to a place where that's what they're working to do. And it's really, really hard. It's really very time consuming. Um, and so I, I just, you know, encourage you to continue to have this, to be, you know, a, a, an area for professional development and conversation and, and growth, because I, I think it's the, the big, it's the biggest piece here that, that we could, you know, we can potentially get to um, in the next couple of months. So, absolutely. Thank yes, thank you for that. Yes, absolutely. We're going to continue to have those type of conversations about 
the whole design process and a part of the learning process and the teaching aspect of it is assessment and feedback. So thank you for that. Absolutely. Great. Thank you. Um, so just a, a couple of things from from me. Uh, one is that, you know, as as we evolve, you know, I, I hope we'll do two things. One is, is continue to build in, you know, what we've learned from this survey. So we we clear hear clearly how these hangout meetings um, connections are very important, yet we still don't have a mandate that all elementary teachers do one or there's no expectation that, you know, I mean, they seem more important at the younger grade level. So maybe, maybe there we say twice a week, um, they'll, they'll be done, but there's no, it's great that 94% of teachers are doing them, but there's again, no structure official requirement that this is going to be part of everyone's experience. So I, again, I would encourage you to do that moving forward. And the other mm -hmm. thing is, the other way to get feedback is, you know, the, your principals are sort of your ears on the ground, even though they're not they're not in their buildings. They know their communities. They can they can and should be reaching. I'm sure they're hearing a lot from parents, but they also can be reaching out to to parents that they know, you know, parents of, of certain types of children who might not be engaging, and parents of other children who uh, may be over engaging, and and sort of doing focus type groups of feedback. Uh, the forms next week that we're that you're scheduling will be will be useful, but on an ongoing basis, I'm sure they're getting some feedback. But uh, I would definitely encourage, you know, as an administrative team to continue, you know, to continually to reach out to parents to see what's working and what's not working because we're changing this on the go and it's very difficult. But clearly, there are things, you know, the survey show there's things that people like, things that aren't working so well. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we need to continue to get that feedback as we go forward. Absolutely. I, I, I agree with you. All right. Thank you. Um, is there any other, Mr. Hainer, you have your hand. I, I, I guess I'd ask the chair, is this the time to ask Dr. Elmer some questions or is that going to be a little later? She has a presentation, I think. Okay. Later. I'll wait. Thank you. So I, I, once again, I just want to thank everybody for uh, for your comments and questions. Um, they're definitely thought provoking and will be taken in consideration. Um, the reason that we did send a survey and it may have seemed like a short amount of time, I do want to address that before I end my presentation is that we're trying to gather all this information and a lot of this planning is taking place this week. So like we're pushing out, you know, mm -hmm. the next phase of the remote learning plan next week. So we have to to be able to you know take this information so as you have all stated we will continue to reach out to the community and get more feedback as we push forward in our next phase in order to continue to evolve in what we're doing so thank you for everything and dr ellis hampy you have anything else thanks sorry i can't mute and then raise my hand and everything at the same time i just wanted to speak and as long as we're talking about feedback i just wanted to speak to some stuff that i've seen over the past couple of weeks on social media um summarizing between 50 and 100 different people's oh, you went up you went on mute you went on mute you went on mute somehow sorry Am I okay? I'm summarizing between 50 and 100 people's responses um, and boiling them down just into like five, six high points. Um, the strong desire for synchronous activity, one thing it wasn't clear always was whether it was for learning or just as a check in or as a means to engage to hopefully motivate learning, but, but this very strong desire for synchronous activity. Um, that there's a feeling among many parents that they felt kind of abandoned by the teachers because of the administration, because of the decision made to not really to do just asynchronous teaching um, to begin with, especially among the uh, younger kids during the first few weeks of the break people felt like, people felt lost. The, kid, the kids felt lost. And that was something that um, was uh, a real negative that they felt. 
um, there's been a very highly variable experience among different parents, I mean, different students, even at the same grade, same school, um, same subject. Um, and there was a desire for understanding, for more communication about how choices are made and wanting more parental input. So I'm glad that there's a forum. Then the last one was that there is a concern that it feels like other districts are doing a better job of faster response. But just to speak, I've been in contact with other districts and basically everyone seems to be hearing that. So all other districts everywhere are doing it better than the home district for any particular town. So that's all. Thank you for that. And I just wanna also acknowledge uh, the hard work that our teachers are doing to reach out to families. And uh, we understand that this is something we're gonna, like I said before, we're gonna to continue to tweak, take the feedback, uh, try to evolve. But uh, it, I just can't end this presentation without giving my utmost appreciation for everybody's effort within the district, uh, working together, administrators, teachers, TAs, all our educators, support people, they're doing a phenomenal job and they're working very hard. So I just want to acknowledge everybody in the district. Yes. I, I would, Go ahead, Dr. Brady. I would want to echo that. Um, I, I believe the teachers are working very hard. Um, this has been a very difficult thing uh, for everyone to really change the whole way that we, we teach, the way we communicate, we live. All of this has been very uh, challenging for all of us. Um, I think it's been particularly hard for parents that have children at home. Uh, you weren't uh, trained to be teachers, most of you. And uh, we also have our teachers at home doing exactly the same thing. So they, they have the experience of what, what you're talking about, what you're experiencing. Uh, to Dr. Allison Ampey's point, um, Yes, I would say that's probably a very common thing that everybody thinks that other districts doing better. But being in, in very uh, weekly communication with a lot of superintendents right around this area, districts are doing the same thing. The emphasis is on a, with very, very few exceptions. One exception I can think of, the emphasis has been on asynchronous and synchronous learning. And the synchronous has been uh, the but emails, chats, uh, hangouts, uh, for the purpose of maintaining those connections uh, with students. But the the actual instruction and the lesson plan, the lessons and the feedback, that's all been done um, asynchronously through classroom or a similar kind of platform. So Google Classroom seems to be the most common. So our teachers are working very hard. Um, uh, I, I think that I, they feel this, a little discouraged that people don't recognize that they are working is very hard. One thing that was a surprise to us on the survey is the number of people who, teachers and staff who um, themselves have some internet issues. This not always in some areas do you actually get the great connections you might have in Arlington with the the um, closest to the city. So the, there there are issues. Everybody's been working through this as best they can, um, but doesn't mean that there's not a lot of things that we can do to improve. And I think that that's what we have had a lot of discussion about over the last um, couple of weeks about how we can um, do a better job. So I appreciate your comments, and um, we certainly uh, we are certainly working very hard and want to do the very best we can for um, all the children in in Arlington who are in our schools. That's uh, my comment on that. So we can go on if you'd like to, Mr. Cardin, into the next part of this. Sure. I just want to um, just shout out to, to Mr. Levy. If you if you ever if you at any point you want to participate, um, just go ahead and go off. Either raise your hand through the app or um, go off mute, and uh, and I'll that'll be a sign for me to call on you. Thanks. Go ahead, Dr. Bodie. Um. Mr. Mason, can you put um, the next uh, PowerPoint up? I'll have to share a screen again. This is in Novus, by the way, if you want to look at it through that. All right. <clears throat> All right. Uh, 
Can you move it uh, you to the next slide? All right. Um, late last Friday, we received um, uh, new guidance from the Department of Education with respect to what uh, what, what districts should be considering doing the high, high direct guidance in terms of the next um, phase, which from for in our case is from May 4th to June 19th. And the, the most important message I believe in this guidance is that they are, highly recommend that we move all students toward a consistent engagement in remote learning with the focus on connectedness, which we've been talking about, and content grade standards that are critical for the success in the next grade. Um, in both cases, we have been looking at how we can improve engagement and we have particularly been looking at, you know, what are the critical standards that uh, we have not taught this year at every grade level, in every discipline, um, and have been looking at, at that for the last couple of weeks. Uh, next. So uh, the key things that, uh, that uh, the Department of Education has uh, put out in its guidelines to strengthen the remote learning plan. It said the connection between educators and students, provide engaging core instruction focused on the content standards, critical for success in the next grade, as well as they, they want us to continue having enrichment, emphasizing the importance of exercise and the importance of play. I suspect parents will say there's no issue on the play part, but. Um, Ensuring a programming that's accessible and communication uh, that is streamlined to students and family. And um, I was, you know, for the most part, I, I think that there was the feedback we received from the uh, survey was that our, the communication is uh, been pretty good uh, from the district, um, but doesn't mean there's not areas that we definitely can improve upon. And we certainly are looking at ways that we can do that. And one of them is that we, now that we have a, a chance to get into this next phase, there's an opportunity for um, uh, sort of a, I don't wanna say a town hall, but a sort of a, uh, an opportunity to answer questions in a live format like this. Next. So they also, what we've talked about tonight, they want uh, educators to reach out to students that are not effectively engaged in the remote learning. And I will say that this is something that uh, teachers have been doing. If, if students have not been uh, turning in assignments uh, through Google Classroom, they have at certainly six through grade 12, they have been uh, sending emails, trying to, trying to engage with those students to find out, you know, you know, what's going on and what can they do to support them. Um, at the elementary level, uh, teachers reach out not directly to students, but have to do that through emails with parents and have asked to have conversations with parents about what they can do to help support the students more. This is something that we, we know that is important to do. We have been doing it and we're going to continue and, and probably up this even more as we go into this next phase because we are going to be advancing the curriculum over the next um, seven weeks. So consider strategic collaboration, teaming and differentiation that makes the remote learning possible. This is happening a lot and it has been going on. There are a tremendous amount of collaboration that's going on at grade level, in department, in learning communities at the middle school, in same course, teachers are teaching the same course. This has really been um, uh, a significant effort. And one of the things that uh, I know that teachers are engaged in meetings, we have a master calendar where I can see a lot of the meetings that are going on. And I can, I can tell you that there are many, dozens every day, everywhere. Uh, next. All right, so in the last, we, we all pretty much know where we've been in the last couple of phases. We've been looking at student connections. We've been engaging in enrichment and deeper learning. And uh, 
we've been focusing already taught skills and concepts. And actually, I've been a teacher for many years myself. Uh, uh, there is still some great value um, of going deeper into already taught concepts. Sometimes you feel that as you're, as you're marching through a curriculum scope and sequence, that um, perhaps the deeper learning of some of that material, it, it doesn't happen for all students. So uh, while um, this may have been an issue that people didn't think that this was worthwhile, um, that it's something that actually is a, a great opportunity for students to deepen their learning. Yes. So what are our key changes that are gonna be going forward in the next seven weeks? Um, well, the important thing is that we have identified the essential concepts and skills that we think that are critical for students to progress to the, uh, the next grade. Now, uh, the Department of Education, when they gave their guidelines last week, identified uh, you know, what they would call the power standards in the, uh, the major content area, well, I don't want to label it major, but in uh, MCAS tested areas. Um, but one of the things that uh, some, a state level organization doesn't know is, is the sequence in which you've taught these concepts. Probably for math, that's a little bit unique in that it does have a sequential um, progression. But for example, with science, you know, when we teach science concepts at the elementary level, it depends upon which classroom has the, that particular kit for those uh, four weeks. So we've we've taken uh, we've looked at our own uh, the state standards. We've looked at our scope and sequence to identify what are the essential and critical skills that students need to have to progress next year, and uh, that is part of our plans for each of the next uh, seven, seven weeks. So um, at the elementary level, in order to have consistency across the whole district, um, the, the curriculum leaders have, and, and teachers as well, and coaches have been working together to make sure that it, we have a uniform um, approach at all the schools in the elementary level. The same thing's true at uh, department levels, at the middle school, and as well as the high school. And all of, and what, why this is particularly important, it, it will inform our planning for the fall 2020. Um, and we, we understand uh, that it's going to be very important to do, to assess when students come back where they are, to do extensive reteaching and reviewing. But what is going to be important for a foundation in that is that all students have had the same experience um, this year. Next. So our plan going forward is a blend of two things. It's a, a blend of asynchronous lessons as well as synchronous um, times for students to be in contact with teachers. Um, the, the uh, lessons will be pushed out, if that's the right word, shared through Google Classroom. Uh, sometimes these will include, in fact, I suspect um, somewhat frequently, these will include videos of instruction, anywhere from four minute to 20 minute videos. One of the things that I think is really a strength of this plan in terms of equity, in terms of our students who need multiple times of hearing uh, a lesson is that you can go back as many times as you want and, re and review and, and look at the video. So rather, we're, we're not going to be advancing the curriculum through Google Hangout Meets um, or the chats. It's going to be through Google Classroom, videos for instruction, explanation of assignments, and um, will also include teacher feedback on those assignments. Because another feature of going forward um, is that at the end of this period, we want to be able to reflect on where students have progressed over this period of time. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Uh, next. So our synchronous connections are again, uh, a stronger, much stronger emphasis on live video sessions at least once per week for each student. 
one of the things that we are we are seeing at the elementary is that teachers are finding having these uh, having Google Hangouts and live video with a class of 22 students that are second graders, first graders, it just doesn't work well. This has been a learning experience as we go forward. So many, many teachers are trying to break these into much smaller groups, maybe for a shorter period of time. Because again, we're learning as to what, um, what students can actually manage in that kind of environment. The one thing that um, we saw in the parent survey is that uh, one of the, the, the major reason why students have not been um, turning in assignments is motivation. And maybe it's from being inspired, maybe it's because they don't think it really counts um, or they've already done this before. But clearly motivation has been an issue. And one of the, the things that we want to emphasize through these video sessions is to um, inspire students to be continuing with their learning. Uh, we'll continue, at this time we'll have a little bit more uniformity through the district in terms of defined office hours when students know that um, a teacher will be synchronous at that particular time. Uh, some, the hangouts can take place in that, um, emails, uh, um, phone calls in some cases. So this is a, a time that they know they can get an immediate response. Though having said that, I will say that teachers get emails all the time from students from six through 12. And I think the response time is, is actually quite um, impressive. Um, so the office hours will include a variety of communication um, that are uh, timely. All right, next, Michael. So Dr. Janger sent out um, to parents last night uh, and the two middle schools today to parents and to students to understand um, what is the plan in much more detail. My letter was really just to sort of set the overall picture of where we were going, um, what the, the, the underlying rationale was, how we came to it, but the very specifics are being being given out through uh, the, the schools. So one of the things that um, all students maybe can take a deep breath on is that uh, if they've completed all of their work and have grades for term three, terms one through three, they for year long cor courses, they will get their five credits. If they were taking a semester class, they will get their full 2.5 credits at the end of third term or, or the PE course is 2.5 for the year. Um, what I think is very innovative and very student focused is the plan for the next quarter, the next fourth term. And that is we are moving on in the curriculum at, in all courses in the high school. And there is going to be a rubric uh, for what would be considered the amount of work that would be sufficient and quality sufficient for a student to receive an audit for that course for the spring fourth term. If they receive an audit, that will go on their transcript and it will also be available when they apply to colleges down the road. So obviously we can't, a teacher can't perhaps make up all of, all of what was missed over the last seven weeks. So the focus is really on what are the key concepts, skills, products, and experiences that will be necessary um, uh, going forward and what they would need to, um, what they need to be able to do. So for students who failed term one to three, they're going to be able to use this time to focus on credit recovery. And in fact, all of that began weeks ago in terms of credit recovery. We all, we, as, part, as part of the high school, there, this is not new this year. The high school focuses, particularly for seniors, in the last half of the year on students um, receiving the credit, doing credit recovery so they're able to graduate. Okay, thanks. So that was. But as I said, Dr. Janger sent out a very long, in fact, I think it's, I don't know, 16 or 18 pages long in terms of uh, more information about uh, the plan of high school.
So the so for Addison and Gibbs, uh, one of the things that has been happening over the last couple of weeks is a lot of conversations. So that um, that basically the, they're they're operating as a middle school. Uh, we wanted to make sure that uh, the way that the next seven weeks are approached by department, uh, by grade, um, it was was similar, and. And, and as as a high school, the the key concepts and skills that are are uh, identified that students should be able to do in order to move on to the next grade, the next course, are are going to be uh, the focus of the next seven weeks, the next seven weeks of assignments and lessons. Again, going back to this issue of motivation uh, and. Some, and another, another answer on that survey was that students may not have turned things in because it was optional. Though I will say, as time has been going on the last few weeks, the percentage of students uh, turning in work has, has, really, uh, has really been much better. So they have agreed uh, to having a non-traditional grading system for the next seven weeks. And uh, it's going to be a three part. So it's going to be M, P, and U. So M meaning that the students have participated and engaged in distant learning activities with consistency. Uh, have they have applied the teacher feedback with instruction and their evident their effort and evidence of work quality. Um, if a student is less than consistent engagement in distance learning. And the work reflects um, some student effort, uh, but student has not fully met the distance learning expectations, they will get a P at the end of these seven weeks. And then U will be that they've unable to determine a distance learning grade at all. Um, they have not participated and there's been little or no student work uh, turned in for feedback. It's a little bit different um, uh, approach, uh, but this will also be helpful as they move from one grade to the next so that the teachers in the next grade can get a sense of, of who coming into their classes have been uh, a fully participant or less so in this in, during this spring term. And this is going to be, as I said, uh, both Addison and Gibbs. All right, um, thank you, next one. Um, the elementary school implementation, the, again, we, I mentioned earlier how important we feel it is that there is consistency across all of the schools. So that we move into the, into the fall and know what we need to assess and know what we need to review, we know that there's been a foundation at all the schools. So there is going to be a uniform work grid that is gonna be used in all of the elementary schools. And that grid will have all the assignments for every day of the week, Monday through Friday, and then we'll have it for every single discipline in the elementary schools. So if you have an art assignment, it'll be decided but what that can be on a Tuesday or is that on that grade or it's going to be on a Wednesday. Music, um, digital learning, we're emphasizing uh, that you know, students practice keyboarding. We're going to give a certain amount of time for each one of the subjects math, reading, writing, science, social studies, all of that is going to be on the grid. The other thing is that that grid, the, we've had feedback from parents at the elementary level that if they just knew what to sort of expect for the week, it'd be easier to sort of be up and running on Monday. So the overview of the week is going to be sent out to parents on, on Sunday night. What you can do in Google Classroom, which is a wonderful feature, is that you can schedule it uh, on a Thursday, even on a Friday to be sent out at a certain time. So that, that's gonna be, that'll be happening. Now, the actual assignments will be in Google Classroom um, beginning on Monday. So you would, you would see the Monday assignments in Google Classroom. You would not see Tuesday or the, the other days. Um, so consistency, and the other thing is we're going to, we, we know how important emotional learning and enrichment activities are, and those will also still be part of the activities and assignments for the week. We are, we are 
the assignments are replacing choice boards. The other piece of feedback principals and teachers for that too have had is that it's hard, it's been hard for parents to sort of pick out what the most important or uh, assignments are from all the choice boards. Well, we're not having choice boards anymore. It's going to be a very defined lessons, very structured. So these are the, big, the overviews. More information will come to parents and to students directly from their teachers and schools. And so that is the, uh, an overview and I'm open to see if there's any questions or comments. Great, thank you. Um, I think most of us, let's go down the list in order. Mr. Hainer, do you wanna start? Yeah, first, first off, uh, I'm a little bit concerned and I hope you can uh, align my concerns. Uh, on the grading at the middle school uh, that you put uh, on that slide, um, uh, anyway, it uh, basically unable to make a determination because of material is not coming in. I'm concerned with any students that do not have a device. I know it's very small. I'm concerned with students that do not have internet capability. I'm concerned with students with English second language uh, that they may not do it. Second language, you may be providing the material in that uh, language, so it's, it's less of a concern. The first two I'm concerned with. So if you want to answer them one at a time, I'll, I'll save my other two. That would be, yes, yeah, that probably makes sense. Um, we, are, we are constantly trying to find out who does not have device. Principals, uh, by the way, have continued to pass out devices when they find out that there's someone doesn't have one or there's insufficient. I think that's one of the things we're finding more that they don't have a device at all. It's that there's not enough devices. Um, we Why? have, when we find out someone doesn't have internet, um, we help them uh, contact, because because somebody mentioned earlier that they can get free internet and they can through Comcast and Verizon. Um, so we have been right. doing that. that we could not agree with you more. And that's been actually one of the issues around equity in the, in the district the last few weeks is trying to narrow, and hopefully we can narrow to zero um, uh, those differences. In a regular school environment, if uh, a student was failing all of a sudden or not turning in work, I'd go to the principal, the principal would talk to the social worker, there'd be outreach to the family. Um, I'm hoping that this is going to be able to continue, that we don't wait till the end of the marking period to give a grade. That if, if Once we have all the students getting the material, if somebody starts to fall, I don't want them to fall through the cracks. If they start not doing something for whatever reason or not turning anything in from the beginning, we find a way to communicate, to find out at the home. There may be something that happened. We always find out something uh, physically, uh, something in the family. It's easy to do in the not we're more comfortable in the normal environment. So I'd ask you to consider that going forward, uh, activating the social workers and things of that nature. I know we there's a lot on everybody's mind, but I don't want all of a sudden to find out at the end of a marking period that a parent or a sibling or somebody got very sick during this and interfered with the communication. It's no, good for the school to know this. No, you're totally you're totally correct on that, and that's actually. Uh, 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 probably our most important concern um, that right. we have going you, forward. Right? You've talked about that before. My yeah, other, we we are totally in agreement on that. One of the things they're building in um, at the at the secondary level is that 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 last week also is an opportunity for it'll for kids to make up work, um, and and then maybe have enrichment for for others. We, we know that and we're trying to, the, probably the best way if, if, um, is to make, actually just pick up the phone and call people. But right. we are going to be watching that. We have been watching that and we have been reaching out. But I think that now that we're, we're, um, we're moving on and advancing the curriculum, I think that it's even more important. We agree. Did I hear you say that you're going to do an assessment or an evaluation at the end of the term to, to, to make no. a determination? No, 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 not this year. Next year, we need to take a look at where we are. Um, 
but we will be doing a review and um, reteaching of some things next year. I think that an assessment sometime at the beginning of the year will be helpful in knowing what actually does need to be retaught and re -emphasized. Okay. Um, do the elementary students have uh, live time uh, visual contact with their teachers? Yes, yes. Okay, and do uh, is the school providing uh, emails, uh, school emails to the elementary level? No. Uh, Why aren't we doing that? What? Why aren't we doing that? I'm concerned with the uh, safety of our teachers communicating uh, with uncontrolled emails. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about that? I'm not sure. Well, I mean, at the at the secondary level, if I'm a student at the secondary level, I have a school uh, email and my teacher talks to me on that email back and forth. They're not private emails. They can be monitored. And uh, there's no, the emails are not a private concern. And I know other school districts, even at the elementary level, are providing email uh, accounts for their elementary students. And I think it's beneficial for all the students and the teachers to be using school emails, not private emails. We, we only use school emails. We, the teachers do, the students don't. We you just said that we're not providing school emails accounts for elementary students. Did no, I misunderstand no. you? We don't, teachers don't email students directly in the elementary. They only oh, I, email I, parents. Okay, maybe I missed. I asked my first question was, is there real time, virtual time with an elementary student and a teacher communicating? Yes, in Hangout, Visual. in, in Hangout. Google Hangout, um, they can also um, they can also communicate in Google Classroom. And by the way, parents, uh, you should know that you can have your student um, uh, have you be able to be into Google Classroom. Um, it, the student is the one who has to actually let the parent in, but yes, they can. No, parents, teachers in the elementary only email parents. Um, they do not email students directly. Now, okay. part of I, our Google Classroom does, does have our elementaries having an account. And we did discuss at some length actually, um, whether we would allow even fifth grade or fourth grade to have active emails uh, accounts activate them other than for their google classroom and we've decided that it's probably not a wise idea i would ask you or someone in the administration to talk to other school districts in the area and find out the benefit of the uh, going forward thank you okay uh, dr alexampi just to follow up on the tag end of what um, Mr. Hainer was saying, I was actually in contact with the district today that is doing, they rolled out um, emails to all their students over the past few weeks um, and they are finding it helpful. I didn't get into specifics about how it's being used. So first I wanted to mention, I appreciate that Dr. Janger sent out the, this, the new plan to parents um, it's helpful having an understanding of what's going on as we go forward, as opposed to just giving it to the students who lose it in their backpack or. Um, so I too had questions about the uh, Audison grading. And first, I'm just wondering why is there a difference between the high school and uh, the middle school in terms of grading? Whereas the high school kind of has a credit-ish versus no record, and where and Audison and Gibbs are doing something where you're you're dinged if if you're not able to participate. Um, I had the same concerns that Mr. Hainer did, especially about kids being sick or family members being sick and being unable to participate for those reasons. So I'm just wondering why why was the decision made to have different grading systems? Well, the grading system between middle and high school are, have a different effect. Um, you you have to have a certain number of credits to graduate from high school. You have to have a certain number of credits uh, as part of entrance to colleges in terms of uh, 
number of courses and uh, credits in those in those uh, courses. It was it was thought that this would be a much more would be very positive for students to have not have credit no credit um, sort of hanging over their heads last term for exactly the reasons that you're talking about that there are a lot of family situations that make it difficult for students to perhaps complete all the work in all of their courses. Mm -hmm. So uh, while we certainly want kids to be able to, uh, to continue at, this, at the, the level that of rigor that is, will be there, um, it may not be possible for a host of reasons. They may be sick themselves. So we don't want to affect their uh, graduation, um, the number of credits they need, we don't want to affect in any way what would be happening with applying to colleges later on, should that if that's what they choose to do. Um, so this was thought to be a much more uh, thought to be very student centric in terms of what how di high school is different than middle schools. In the middle school, um, there's there's not going to be any ding to them. It's just trying to it's it's. Part of it is also, uh, we saw in the survey that having assignments be optional, having uh, no, or having um, student motivation was an issue, that what this is an opportunity to sort of have students feel like that, they're, that they are recognized for the work they're doing. And in fact, there was initial discussions about whether it would be binary. And I think that, again, going to a more student-centric view of this, we don't want any student to feel that um, they have, have sort of give up the give up give it all up when they don't feel like they're meeting everything that they are being asked to do. We we want to acknowledge their efforts, and we realize that there's going to be a lot a host of, of concerns in terms of uh, that might prevent them from doing all of this. So we're trying to it, it, try to get that that balance between being student focused because we know that there's a lot of issues that, that families are dealing with right now. And at the same time, um, try, because we're moving on with the um, advancing the curriculum, we want to be able to reflect back to students what they are doing and accomplishing, as well as be able when, when teachers next year see the the reports, they can get a better sense of what the level of um, participation was. Okay. Um, then my other question is, um, when you were talking about for the elementary students having live video and stuff, I'm wondering, how are you transmitting best practice experience to teachers? Because apparently for younger age groups, it's easier if the teacher actually shares their screen with, instead of having a screen, having it live on their um, iPad or whatever. Um, and because Google Hangouts pops around as, um, as someone speaks and stuff, it works better if the teacher has the group on their screen and then shares that to the students. So the teacher can see everybody and the students can see everyone, but it, it's because they're seeing the shared screen and it technologically it works better, um, but clearly you have to know what you're doing and, and stuff. And I'm wondering how are you, how are people learning about best practices and then sharing, you know, how are other teachers learning about it? We've, we've spent a lot of time creating classes for people, and I, maybe uh, Dr. McNeil wants to, to jump in on this question, the answer too. Um, this is all new. This is very new in terms of how teachers are connecting with students, as well as how to teach in a remote learning environment. We're certainly learning as we go along. Um, Teachers, when we offer these classes and our um, sign up in droves, as we go forward, you know, there's going to be classes and really, how what are some of the best practice in remote learning? So, the answer is that um, it's evolving. I guess is the best way to say it. 
but we have a pretty robust and will increasingly robust um, PD in some of these uh, in some of these issues. Just the technology of it all. Mm -hmm. uh, you, how do you do as you were describing? What is the best way to organize a hangout? Uh, Dr. McNeil, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah. So um, we do have a digital learning team. Uh, we also have a director of digital learning, uh, Dr. Uh, Susan Bisson. Um, she just successfully defended her dissertation. So she is now Dr. Susan Bisson, but uh, she is our director of digital learning for the district. Um, and we do have technology specialists at the uh, elementary, middle and high school level. And on this digital literacy, um, digital learning team, there's representation from all buildings. Uh, so they've uh, worked together to put together a, a very robust, uh, professional development plan that includes the initial um, instruction on how to set up Google Classroom and utilize Google Hangouts Meet. And they've also taught, uh, done a very good job of, of looking at the various extensions that can be utilized with those uh, Google um, tools that can provide just what you were talking about, uh, a gallery view of the class, and also a jam board, which is uh, like a, a virtual whiteboard that can be shared with students uh, so they can create projects. So, and then they've also sent out a survey to teachers to, um, you know, get feedback on things that they still need to learn in order to increase their knowledge and how to use these various tools. And so based upon that feedback, they're setting up more um, additional um, uh, professional development classes that can add on to that basic understanding of how to use uh, all of the um, tools within the Google suite. That, that's great. I guess I'd just add that it'd be helpful to be looping parents into that also to understand where things are breaking down because like the Google stuff, it seems to work kind of okay if you're on a computer, but if you're on an iPad, which a lot of the younger kids may well be um, it doesn't there aren't as many options and it doesn't work as well and that's when you have the teacher has to implement um, like you said the gallery view and stuff but the teacher isn't going to know about that because they're going to be working on their computer probably um, so that's a suggestion thank you thank you for that one suggestion that came up yesterday in the uh, community relations subcommittee is classes for parents on some of these things. Yeah. Because we're all sort of learning, some, the older of us are a little bit slower on learning some of these things. Um, I know that, uh, I'll talk with uh, the Director of Community Education. I know there's gonna be some technology virtual classes there. That might be the best way for us to um, engage parents in some uh, opportunities like that. And uh, I, I thought about that yesterday and I just haven't had a chance to talk with her today about it. But that may be the, the, the avenue for that. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you. Um, uh, right. so, um, there's been questions about special education and there's Sorry. been a lot of guidance that we have um, had from the, the federal government as well as the state. And I think uh, um, Ms. Elmer is gonna give us sort of another overview of special ed and then ask answer your questions, Mr. Hainer? Yeah, I think I think there are still questions on your yeah, presentation. Oh, there are. Sorry. Oh, sorry. We didn't go through all, all the way through yet. I can't. <laughs> I don't see them. All right. Sorry. Ms. Seuss, you're next. Uh, yeah, I have an easy question and then a little harder question. Um, so the easy question is, uh, how is this information being sent out to parents? Is it um, is the same information being sent out to all parents or are there grade specific you know, so elementary parents are getting some pieces of information and high school parents are getting a very different piece of information. Um, it might be interesting to do both actually, um, to have something that's targeted to each level, but also sort of say, oh, by the way, here's what else is going on in the rest of the district. Um, then on communication as well, just a reminder that might be helpful to, to give parents instructions about how to tell their kids to invite them to the Google Classroom because that's um, something that only some parents know about. So it might be good to, to spread that more widely. Yeah. So that's the 
easy question. Then the harder question or, or the bigger picture question is, I know something that Arlington has done really well in the past is um, that teachers share, um, teachers who are expert at a subject or a technique or, or, or doing something really well, um, have all these ways to share that knowledge with each other. Um, I mean, teaching can be very lonely and I suspect it's, it's even more lonely feeling right now. Um, so I'm wondering if there are some either formal or informal avenues for teachers to talk to each other, to share what they're doing, to you know support each other in in, in new ideas and and so forth. Um, okay. Uh, yes, to Google Classroom, we should get that instructions out to parents so they know how to do it. In fact, I was just doing that with my own daughter today. Said, so you know, you can be invited into Google Classroom. Um, so we will do that. We need to get that instruction out. Um, with respect to sharing, there's a lot. It's, let, let's not, I think I need to be clear. I mean, it's not the same as being in school where you see people next door to you or you're walk down the hall or you're having lunch it's, or you're attending curriculum meetings in the afternoon. It's not the same. But having said that, there's been a major effort to create opportunities for teachers to um, communicate with each other and be together. For example, one of the things at the elementary, as you know, this year we've had these um, grade level meetings at which we look at, at data and, and special educators, coaches, principals are all part of those grade level meetings. Those are still going on. Mm. Um, we're, we're still having robust department meetings. Um, learning, we're at the middle school, learning community meetings. Yeah, I was just going to add to that, um, Dr. Bodhi, in that to answer your question, Dr. Seuss. Um, so as far as the social emotional connection that you were speaking to and uplifting, um, since I'm on all of the building <laughs> um, mailing lists, they, they are doing trivia teams, they're doing book clubs, they're doing daily meditation, they have um, health and wellness check-ins that are just for them. They're not about outside of the student SST teams. Um, so they're doing a lot and also our school counseling department and through the teams, through the uh, school counselors and social workers have also been pushing out a lot of support in that regard. Um, and then as Dr. McNeil mentioned, the digital learning folks. So in addition to what's being offered kind of district-wide in those PD, each person is reaching out at the building level to do smaller. Um, I can, you know, when people are like, I can't get onto that calendar again, because I'm on all these mailing lists, <laughs> I, I see the back and forth, uh, you know, and, you know, someone's helping them to get on the mailing list or setting up a smaller group so they can go over how to share your calendar view or things like that. So the teachers are really looking out for each other and the principals have been taking a big lead on that kind of support for the staff as well. Mm -hmm. Did we hit all your questions? Oh, uh, the other question was about um, how are you sending the information out? Is it by grade level or is it just one sort of document with everything? Um, well, Dr. Janger sent his out last night uh, and uh, Ms. Francisco and Mr. Maringer sent them out today. These are parent specific and then to staff and 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 at the middle school, actually in the elementary too, actually at all of our levels, there's sort of in the morning messages that are going out too. Uh, so there, there's been a big effort to try to keep to keep people in the loop and, and communicating. Yeah. All right, uh, Mr. Thielman, you're up next. Thank you, uh, Lynn. Um, so, I want, I want to applaud uh, the district for coming up with this plan. Uh, it's pretty clear to me there's a lot of thought that went into it. There's a lot of conversation among the district leadership teachers. Um, I, uh, I had the same experience that Kersey had um, in that I've, I've spoken to a few other people uh, that are in other districts. In fact, I got an email from a constituent who was praising this district and I happen to have a colleague who has a child in that district. And uh, <laughs> she, she was not singing the praises of the district. She said that you know, what they had on the website looked great, but her actual experience on the ground was entirely different, at least with her child. So um, you know, I think this is, a, 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 this, is, this is great progress. 
and uh, I think we're moving in the right direction. So I think that's a good thing. I do um, a couple of things. One is I, you know, I hope we're, um, I'm sure we are, but uh, uh, we're collecting best practices from this whole experience and we're making notes about it um, because I think in the future, um, this might be, you know, doing, you know, go, saying we're gonna, gonna go to remote learning um, is a way to uh, reduce or eliminate um, snow days. Um, I also think it's time in education to do some assessment and reflection about seat time um, because there, we may have something here that uh, challenges some of those assumptions. Um, and the, the um, you know, the other the thing I am most interested in seeing is how uh, the district on a grade by grade and student by student level assesses uh, each student's progress to determine um, how to craft their learning uh, and the instruction they're going to need next year in the fall. Um, so I, I, I'd, I'd love to know, first I'll stop there and then Dr. Bode, I'd love to know if you've kind of thought about um, how, how you're going to do that kind of an assessment so that when we return to uh, traditional instruction, you're able to um, respond to where each learner is because every child is going to have I me mean, I have three learn three children in my house three different learning styles three different responses to this whole um, pandemic um, and so uh, you know I'm just wondering how you're going to do that well in a couple of ways we're going to assess it uh, it's already been going on in terms of what's working well or not there's the there's the there's so many different ways to look at it technologically in terms of the kind of assignments, um, how long, how do you do feedback that's, that's not where you get the piece of paper uh, directly. Uh, it, there's a lot of things that we're learning. We'll do some of it qualitatively from our curriculum leaders and principals for sure. Um, we will also be doing, I think, this this first time through with the survey, we'll, we'll craft maybe a better survey as we go through um, the next sort of halfway through and then toward the end, we have to gather this. But I think to your point is that one of the things that's been on our mind is the uncertainty of the next year. I, you know, I don't know if we're going to start in September. I certainly hope so. Um, I don't know if there's going to be disruptions during the winter. I don't know if there'll be disruptions to individual schools. What will we do then? And so we are, when we talked about this, we realized that this is an important learning experience for all of us, not just our students, as we go through these next few weeks as to what we're going to learn from it that's, that's going to inform what we could do next year and maybe even beyond that. I mean, I, you're, you're at your point about um, snow days, you know, I don't know what, what this is. We, we, we all know that this is a pivotal moment, not only in education, in families, in communities, in the country, in terms of how it's going to be future. And we don't have a full crystal ball, but we, we need to learn from what we're doing so we're better prepared the next time. Yeah. Okay, all right. Um, and then um, I do, I, I would imagine that when we return to instruction, there's gonna to have to be a period of time in which you assess each learner and get a sense of to the degree to which they advanced last year and how um, far behind they are on the concepts they, they needed to have learned to have entered say fifth grade or sixth grade or seventh grade. And then you're gonna to have to modify instruction in the fall or, or you're gonna to have to do some recovery in the fall. Is that? That's is that, absolutely correct. Yeah. And so we will have to figure out what those assessments will look like in the fall. Yeah. Um, and we will, we're, we, fortunately this time we have some time over the summer uh, to spend planning for different eventualities, what that's gonna look like in terms of review, what it's gonna look like in terms of assessments. So um, we know that, we, we know that we are gonna have um, to, to be doing that next year because of what we've all said is that some, for some students, this is going to be very hard. Yeah. And um, yeah. 
Yeah. Okay, and then and, and then I I I'm assuming that there there are discussions taking place within the district about um, <clears throat> if if we're not able to if we have to continue remote work in the fall, mm -hmm. and that is probably out of our of our hands. Are you do you have kind of a a, a team? Is the team working on uh, what happens if 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 that's the case? Well, we've certainly had discussions about it. I think we've been also inundated in managing currently where we are that we haven't spent a lot of time on that but we we've acknowledged that we need to and let's document what's going on now so that this becomes a, a basis for the planning that we know will have to take place and finally we had a conversation yesterday uh, uh, about forums are you going to talk have you kind of given some thought to how you're going to do parent forums and well uh, the the answer is uh, what I thought maybe uh, 24 hours ago may have shifted a little bit. Uh, I had, as you know, there's been some um, forums. There was a there was one last week, and then there was one with the Board of Health last night on the town side. And I I said I thought it would be a great idea if the schools could we could do it as well. But I thought it would be better to do it after we start the new plan. Yesterday, when we discussed this a little bit, there was some thought about maybe, um, you know, doing it by level, uh, and and that may be the best way of doing it. Maybe that it might be better to do it um, at least at the elementary level, maybe by school. So that kind of conversation started this afternoon. So this is an evolving plan, but the answer is that yes, we're planning to do something. Um, and, and to find out what would be the best kind of format for that. Um, and I've talked to our town manager about what he's learned from these experiences and have some advice on that, on that front. So yes, it's, it's, we are going to do it. I don't have dates um, at, this, at this point, uh, but we certainly are gonna do this and I'll let people know when they're going to be and how to participate. All right, thank you. My, my, my final comment is, uh, is that, um, I realize we're two and a half hours into this meeting, uh, is that uh, I want to I wanna thank, Kristen Francisco sent out a video last night or this morning, or whatever, I, that's when I saw it for the sixth grade Gibbs school. And I thought it was just great. It was very clear. She had a PowerPoint in it. It was very warm, uh, friendly, clear. So um, uh, kudos to her. And I and Matt Janger's uh, uh, information that he sent out last night too. The 16-page document was also very helpful. So mm -hmm. thank you to, to them. And and I just want to thank everybody in the district for the work. I mean, this working under these conditions is uh, is is stressful. It's confusing. Uh, people are tired. Parents are tired. People doing the work are tired. So thank you. Thank you. All right, Mr. Sickman, you're next. Uh, thank you. A lot of the questions that I, were, I was pondering uh, have already been asked. Uh, I will confess that I'm also listening with an ear for what's going to happen next year. If I had to guess, uh, my guess would be that we'd come back and then be interrupted at some point during the year. So, you know, one of the things that I'd like to hear about in the future, not this meeting, is what our budgetary asks would be in order to have the infrastructure available so that if we're forced to go out again we're we have the resources that we want to have in order to plan out an interruption and so i'll just leave the questioning at a desire to hear a little more about how we're servicing our second language learners mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, was that something you wanted to address in the future, Paul, or looking for an answer, right? A uh, brief answer and something for the future. Um, with respect to budget, that is definitely on our mind. Right. Now, the, the, English, the English language learners, you want oh, to know. Um, uh, yes, the, there's been a tremendous outreach to our English language learners um, through the teachers at the schools. And, and I know that from personally talking to some of them. And I know that from the director. Uh, so they are in communication with students. And yes, this remote environment is very challenging for a lot of families. Uh, they've also helped 
us be able to put some devices into students' hands as well. Um, one of the things that is um, a glitch in when, when I send things out on school, on school messenger, if anything goes over 5,000 characters, I can't translate. So when I, when I send something out, I always try to translate, but if it exceeds that, so I mean, maybe I should just do it in two parts, uh, but I don't know um, how that could be received, but I go part one, part two to parents, then I could translate it. But we, but we, the, the teachers are also then contacting parents, translating what's going on. It is an issue. And, but I say our, our teachers have just been absolutely fantastic in reaching out. Yeah, that, that's basically been my biggest concern through all of this, because that's probably the most at risk group we've got. Uh, in that those are the parents who are least likely to be having the skills to interact uh, aggressively with the system. And so that some sort of a report going forward, uh, uh, specifically on how we're interacting with that population, I think would be very important. Perhaps we could, yes, we can put that on the agenda going forward at some time, give you more information. Great. Thank you, um, Ms. Morgan. I just have two quick questions. The first is, um, you know, I know that uh, information has come from the uh, principals in grades six through 12. Do we expect to hear from elementary principals about what next week looks like tomorrow? So that's my first question. And the second question is um, at any grade level, are, um, I know that you know you were talking about how there would be assignments posted in Google Classroom. Is there a vision? And I was looking through the email that Mr. Janger sent um, or Dr. Janger sent about the high school. Is will there be a, a, a time or a, an assignment that will be due at any point the same day that it is assigned? So are, are any of these assignments that are going to be given out starting Monday going to be due, you know, same day or 24 hours later? Or um, can you tell us a little bit more about the structure of that? I've heard from a number of parents, especially about the, at the elementary level, that they're, they're pretty anxious about what's going to happen on Monday. Um, well, the, the answer is mixed. I mean, sometimes the assignments... Well, at the secondary level, they're going to get their assignments for the whole week uh, on Monday. Or at Gibbs in the high school, it's staggered, as you will, from the communications. So in other words, you won't get everything on Monday, but you might get all of math on Monday, and you might get social studies on Tuesday, that type of thing. Uh, so, but at the elementary level, um, there will be a mix of longer assignments and shorter, let's do the work right now. Um, parents, as I said, can get onto Google Classroom and, and uh, sort of monitor that if, if they so choose. So just to, so could theoretically an assignment be posted at nine o'clock in the morning on a Tuesday and due at four o'clock on Tuesday? Well, the, the thing about the remote learning is there is a lot of ability to turn something in. Say, so say that there was something like that. And I'm not saying there wouldn't be, but if there was, it doesn't, you can also turn it in the next day or the following day. What we're trying to do is to have this be as um, family, child focused as possible. We don't want a lot of rigidity in this because we know that that's not going to work well and it's not gonna work well for students. So are they going to be, there's no grade on it. It's, it's an opportunity for feedback, for learning. That's what we're looking at is for learning. Okay, I just, I guess my feedback just about that um, is that you know, uh, we talk a lot in our family about how what we're doing now is going to translate into where we are in September, and we're using a lot of the same tools, right? We're using Google Classroom, and and we talk a lot in our family about the need to like make sure that you're submitting things and that things are getting done and in a timely way. And I just want to make sure that the expectations for submission are realistic. Um, and you know, I don't want to get into a situation where we have a lot of family 
families who are saying, well, yeah, I mean, it says it's due at four o'clock on Tuesday, but like, there's no way you're going to get it done. So don't worry about that. You know, you can do it late. It just, it, the messaging becomes really hard with kids. Right. So, you know, I hope that that's just something that I, I'm sure that, you know, people will be mindful of that. Um, so. I, I thought there's going to see much, any, I'm not saying it would never happen, but the thing about all of this is it's asynchronous you might find some students doing this work in the evening when their parents can help them because their parents are working all day. We're not going to have something to do at four o'clock when they're not even getting to it. Great. Great. And they have a day where they can do more work than the day before because someone's been sick. I mean, what we're trying to do is build in that, that sweet spot. If you want to think of it that way, between something being uh, flexible, but at the same time, having structure to it. Yep. And I don't know if we can get the perfect balance, but that's what we're trying to achieve. Great. Yeah. It's, it's, you'll never be able to get the perfect balance for every student. Right. So, but, exactly. but the, intent, but the intention, you know, as long the intention sounds really promising. So thank you. Great. Thank you. So it just briefly from, from myself, um, just, just to the committee, I mean, we do have a, curriculum and instruction subcommittee. If people want more discussion of this plan and the issues over the next two weeks, that would be a good place um, to do that and take some of the load off of our, our next meeting. Um, I guess reach out to, to Jane if, if, if that's your <laughs> request. Um, the only other thing I wanted to raise was um, uh, out of the points from, from one of the, the submissions, was this idea of, of parent-teacher conferences or, or more, more structured parent-teacher interaction. And I just wanted to you know, request uh, as we're going into new material in particular um, that you know, particularly at the elementary level, we think about a way to accomplish that. Um, uh, you know, it, it can be a, an email from the teacher saying, you know, I have the, I have my office hours. Please send up for sign up for a ten minute block or whatever. Um, but I think we need to give our parents a way um, to talk with their teachers. A, a parent can email a teacher right now and ask if they can have an email response. Um, teacher. Yeah, but that none of the communications have said parents. that. They none are. of the yeah, but none of the communications have sort of said that. That's not necessarily an expectation. So. Uh, Again, more structure as as around that I think might be appreciated. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do we want to move on to uh, special education? I just think I need to be allowed to share my screen if Michael or who you got it, Michael. Alrighty. You should be. Am I? Is it? Uh, let's see here. Yeah. Okay, and then I just want to be able to start the slideshow. All righty. So um, I apologize. Uh, these were going to be embedded in Kathy's uh, uh, slide deck, so there's no opening titles or anything. Um, so um, I understand from the request that um, you wanted an update on both the state regulations and how we're implementing them here regarding special education. So I did take from the actual, the DESE's um, PowerPoint on this um, and kind of um, edited it to put in uh, Arlington, what we're doing here. But as you've already heard, so I'll go quickly through this, um, you know, the, the emphasis on the safety and well being of the students and families, as well as the equity and the connection between uh, school and staff, is still the guiding principles, as it is with general education. And, um, and I mentioned this last time. So, service delivery uh, is a combination of both supports and services and instruction and um, supports and resources and instruction and services. And so, early on from the beginning, the supports and resources that um, special educators have been providing around the accommodations for the general ed enrichment, the um, sharing of individualized uh, either lessons or schedules, um, all that kind of stuff was in place. And then as we moved, um, once we got the updated guidance, we've moved into uh, teacher-led instruction and delivery of related services or therapies um, 
so to speak. Um, and those come in, you know, the format of both for our uh, supported learning center or SLC classes, you know, whole class instruction, small group, or even individualized. Some of them are getting one to ones. Um, and so again, this is, I said it last week as well, um, that it's a combination of um, the supports and resources um, for what, you know, kids who are getting, most of our students are in inclusion setting, so they're still participating in their Google Classroom with their grade level um, teacher or peers. Um, and so the special educators are joining those classes at some points. Uh, I just know this week, um, you know, one of them was leading a uh, framing your thoughts lesson for the entire class, um, but the TAs and the special educators are co-teachers in the Google Classroom and that they can, you know, see the assignments, they can add to it. Uh, TAs have been asked to jump on to the live sessions to help um, if teachers need people moderating chats or, or helping with that. So they're, they're present in those settings and the quote general ed setting. Um, and they'll continue, especially as we move forward with these new assignments uh, coming out from the general educators to make the accommodations if modifications are required and to scaffold that instruction. Um, and so this I already shared with you uh, last week, what we have been doing around that. Um, again, the emphasis on communication prior to this, um, we were already in a um, space where they were to be reaching out to families directly um, twice a week. Um, they have implemented, um, uh, people can sign up for consults. Um, and so they can sign in to either for a phone call or uh, uh, Google Hangout, or some, some people are just emailing um, back and forth with questions around assignments or sending, you know, a picture of the work and getting, you know, feedback on what they should be doing. Um, and so with Dr. Bodie's uh, you know, directive around offering um, discrete office hours, you'll be seeing that in their schedules as well. Um, and so this other piece is the instruction and services. Um, and again, this is just, again, what the state's directive was around that. And um, we have our teachers have been Similar to what you're hearing, the feedback around general ed, um, and either Dr. Bodie or Mr. Levy can speak to the agreements around live sessions. Um, you know, we have some teachers who are doing, you know, a morning meeting every day and then breaking out into their reading sessions, their math sessions. Um, some people are doing this through their own Google classrooms. Um, a lot of uh, people are participating in the PD that's being offered by the digital learning department, and you'll see uh, Google Slides and uh, recordings um, from the teacher, um, you know, walking them through that some of our therapy providers, OTs and that, you're gonna find more of that kind of format of I'm going to be videotaping, obviously something, our PT. Um, similarly, you know, a, a live session isn't quite the same, isn't as easily deliverable um, through, uh, you know, a computer screen. Um, and so, and then it's just even, uh, old school, so to speak, telephone calls. Um, for some families that's worked well. I know um, Carla Bruzzese has shared as well, that particularly for our EL families, to your point, uh, Mr. Schlickman, the, the phone calls have seemed to be more successful uh, with those families and that was a more effective way of communicating. And so we're seeing that with our um, some of our special ed families, but it really is about what works for the individual. Um, so, uh, I mentioned that we had sent out our individual remote learning plans um, and they're lengthy documents, uh, you know, and certainly, you know, can appreciate that they aren't necessarily translate as easily as I'm taking a grid and people who are used to seeing an IEP, seeing that translated, um, but they're providing, uh, whether that's consultation with staff um, or directly with families, um, that those services are denoted in the individual um, learning plans. And then again, that general ed support, that would be what we would call the B grid, um, that's denoted in those plans. And then the individual, if you're getting, you know, pull out uh, reading or the OT or the speech services, um, those things are also denoted separately um, in the plans. Um, again, it continues to be, as the state has recommended, a combination of those online. I think we are probably doing more of the live sessions. I think, um, 
for our students who really need either feedback in the moment or able to ask questions while they're doing the work. Um, and generally, special educators, when they're doing those pullout um, services are working with smaller groups already. Um, I know that we've been, for the last four weeks, we've been uh, working with Dr. Melissa Orkin, who's been our reading consultant, to, she's been providing PD each week on how to deliver reading instruction through this new virtual format. So she's been leading them through the different tools and resources and how we can take our structured literacy routines and now move them online. And, you know, hearing stories from, you know, one very resourceful teacher who is still waiting for her uh, webcam to arrive and who has learned to write backwards so that, you know, it comes out forward on the screen um, until she can get that webcam that flips. Um, so people are being really innovative. Um, I know a reading specialist who did do a, a reading session over the phone because uh, she, the family was having technical difficulties uh, with their connectivity and so she switched over to a phone call. Um, so, and we've had some families who, I'm gonna be frank, I'm not gonna recommend this and it's unlikely, but we've had some people who've even agreed to do a Saturday session because that worked with somebody. Um, I, I don't think that should be set as an expectation, but I just share that people are being really flexible. Um, and so, um, there was a question and I'm trying, I did receive your questions, uh, Mr. Hainer in advance. So I'm trying to include some of this in here. Um, a team meeting was not required um, in order to develop these plans. Um, however, families have those plans within the plan. It, it indicates who they should contact, um, you know, if they have questions, if they, um, Beyond the individual service provider, it has listed the team chairperson and the uh, coordinator as contact people um, or the liaison for those families. Um, so if people do have questions about their remote learning plans um, and they wanna talk about that more, they should reach out to the individuals that are listed in their individual letter because obviously that is different for each person. Um, and so, um, a question also came up just about how do we document or how are we keeping track of that? So as providers, they're always taking their quote clinical notes while delivering um, service, but we also have created um, service logs that we've asked them to share um, as well as communication logs so that they're keeping track of both their outreach and the responses to the different types of outreach um, and tracking the services they're delivering. Obviously any emailing between um, they and a family is, you know, an email record. Um, and so, as I mentioned, we created one um, share doc. We recommended that we created one share document so that multiple providers could be, you know, putting that in for one student. So we didn't have an OT log, a speech log, uh, uh, learning specialist log all for one student, but that they're in one place if that's um, needed. So um, I think I went through that quickly. I was trying to catch up on time. Um, do you have questions? Thank you. We'll run down the list, Mr. Hainer. Mr. Hainer, you're on mute. Mr. Hainer. I apologize. Uh, I, you answered one of the questions clearly. Uh, one of the other ones may not have been clear. Uh, what is the district's protocol uh, oh. for holding team meetings on annual reviews and expanded uh, school uh, programs that they kids normally have during the summer? So the first question uh, is, we are holding any meetings with mandated timelines that, as I mentioned, uh, our last session. So um, annual reviews, if they're scheduled during this this period or were already, you know, um, in the beginning of the period, we did, I mentioned we had been working with our, um, on our Easy IEP, um, our student database um, platform, and we now do have the parent portal. So that's up and running. So we started um, IEP meetings last week and we're scheduling those that were previously missed between March and up until last week and then going forward. So anyone, any of those meetings with a mandated timeline, um, so annuals, in, uh, evaluation, so initials or three years, if the testing was completed prior to the um, closure, we're scheduling those meetings. Um, and so those are more likely the meetings that were, you know, right around March, you know, 13th, uh, you know, through the um, third, 
25th, 30th, because the testing was would have already been done for those. Um, those that we need to do the testing, we were not able to obviously complete testing um, due to the social distancing requirements. Most of the standardized assessments require face-to-face -face interaction. Um, so those meetings uh, we are not having, however, um, we will hold an annual review for a reevaluation um, if it's during this timeline. Um, and as part of any uh, IEP meeting, when you're developing an IEP, you need to consider the need for uh, extended school year. We don't know currently right now what format that's going to take, obviously, until we learn more from the state what when they're going to be lifting social distancing and what that's going to look like. So, but we're still having those discussions about um, you know, whether a student requires extended school year at the time of the IEP. Those, those, those IEPs that you that would require testing that you are unable to do, mm -hmm. are you communicating this to the parents? So, and, and, and I, I guess I'm not looking to make anything litigious, Yep. but the, the SPED law never anticipated this pandemic. There's no question on right. that. And there's very little latitude in extending timelines under the, on the, under the law prior to this, uh, unless the parents agree. So my suggestion is to talk to Desi, find out where, what you can and can't do and communicate this is in a proactive way with the parents to get them on your side. Right. So, um, every Friday, uh, Russell Johnson, who's the, um, what's his full title, uh, Dep commissioner. Um, yeah. Um, I know who you mean. Yeah. So he's the, essentially the state director for um, special education. Um, he has a weekly meeting with a uh, SPED director. So um, I'm on those calls each week. Uh, they've been clear around the piece with the testing. And so we, if you go to the district website um, for the special ed page that's in there, and then Dr. Bodie um, sent out a letter for us indicating that around that we would begin to be having the IEP meetings for required timelines. Um, anyone, again, can reach out to the team chair people and people have been reaching out, you know, with questions about when's my meeting coming up. As I mentioned, we just right. started last week. So they're sending out the um, invitations. Um, so I guess my, my thing is I would not wait for the parent to contact you. I would, and I, it's, I th think you just stated it, we should be contacting them with, with what you can do, what you can't do, their choices and stuff, and clear like that. One other question I have for you, uh, those students at the elementary level that have an IEP of one-to-one uh, -one assistance, mm -hmm. um, are they going to be active with this program starting on Monday with the, the students that they're assigned to? So the special educators, we've already been, we, you know, we had the directive um, back at the end of um, March that we needed to move forward with service delivery. Um, so we have been um, delivering services. Um, so right, but I, I'm talking about we, a child that's involved in inclusion, okay. has a one one to one support, they're going to be giving assignments by the elementary teacher. Right, and I mentioned that the teachers so are signed up. So is there a, co is there a coordination with them? Yeah. So as I mentioned, I, maybe I was speaking quickly. The TAs are also in those classrooms, so they're the TA, the, the co-teacher role in the Google Classroom. So they've been um, asked to join those classrooms, um, and then if there's an online session, we've been they've been asked to join those online sessions. We don't have a large number of students that have one-to-ones per se. They may have TA support in their IEP, but there's few that have a dedicated one-to-one -one all day. Okay, thank you. Yep. Great, um, Dr. Allison Um, Thank you for your presentation. Um, I don't have any questions, just a comment that as we solicit feedback from parents about how things are going, I hope that we would, um, do a special effort to collect information from um, our special education parents um, in terms of are the services helpful? Are there, is there ways they could be tweaked to be more helpful? Um, you know, are, are we doing what we can and is there any way of doing it better? That's all. Great, thank you. Um, Ms. Seuss. Um, yeah, nothing. Actually, I do have one question. Sorry. Um, so I know that we have uh, state and federal mandates around IEPs, and those are obviously our students of greatest need. 
Um, I was wondering, are we also doing anything with uh, kids on 504s or other sort of support? Is there... Uh, and, and uh, did doc, I don't know if Dr. McNeil wants to respond to that as the, um, he's the 504 coordinator for the district, um, mm -hmm. if you wanna jump in. Yeah, the expectation is that we're gonna continue and give the type of accommodations, but you know that's gonna change because in the 504 plan, it's really based upon the accommodations that are given within the physical environment. Right. So, but moving forward uh, with the 504 plans, I mean, that's gonna be very difficult because the students are at home, but we're still, yes, absolutely. The expectation is that whatever we can do to support the learning of those students in 504 plans that we're continuing that to the best of our ability. Okay. Great, thank you. Uh, Mr. Thielman. Uh, all my questions have been answered. Thanks very much for the presentation. Great, Mr. Schickman. I'll also pass, thank you. Ms. Morgan. Yeah, so my question is, um, how are you planning to evaluate um, the degree to which we are being, we are able to offer services to kids in this environment? Because I would imagine that, um, you know, if we were in the buildings and, and, you know, kids have IEPs and they have their grid and they're receiving their services based on what's in their grid. And at some point you could say, okay, yeah, you know, we were able to provide, you know, X percentage or the vast majority of what, you know, we were, we had, had been able to do. And because of X, Y, and Z, this didn't happen. I guess it just feels like right now, you know, with everybody, you know, everybody is so dispersed. Um, I'm just wondering what kind of accountability you're expecting from, you know, from our, from our service providers and, and how are you going to measure whether or not, um, you know, and, and how are you going to define success, I guess, in terms of what, what you're delivering to these kids? Sure. So I mentioned that they're, they have service logs. So they, they're, they're logging not only that delivery of content, but any outreach, any communication, um, any consultation. Um, so we do, we can measure actually relatively easily whether how much was provided. Um, the other thing that um, is, we have an obligation um, under the IEP to also report on progress. So teachers have to, at least as frequently as students receive report cards, they have to provide progress against their individual IEP goals. So teachers are collecting all of that data as we go along. Now we've talked about, you know, how do you collect it in this format where you might have kept, you know, a running record, for an example, while you were listening to somebody read. Um, so they're definitely having to adapt that. One of the things that we're um, working with Dr. Uh, Orkin on is how do we use some of the um, some of the online learning applications that can track progress, um, you know, where uh, Seesaw is one um, tool that we're going to be uh, giving the teachers professional development on for the next two weeks on those Thursday or the once a week sessions I mentioned we have with her. Um, and Seesaw is essentially, it has a, like a learning component of it in that it, you, the teacher's design lesson and getting um, the input or the, the student has to respond and then they're, they're collecting that data. Um, so we've been exploring the different ways in which you can do that. But also, you know, um, uh, Ms. Nolan's not here this week, Mr. Le uh, Mr. Levy is as our uh, rep, but she's also a speech and language pathologist. So she can tell you how during their teletherapy, they're taking notes on, you know, the output that they're getting from a student. We certainly have to shift it and it's not as easy uh, as it has been, um, but that's part of the requirement for special ed um, anyway. Great, thank you. Um, I'll, I'll just add that, you know, it's an extremely difficult way to deliver, deliver most of these types of services, um, you know, both in regular ed, and, but in special ed particularly, um, it's not just a matter of not progressing, but we're gonna see a lot of regression, unfortunately. Um, and, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're gonna have to address this in the fall and, uh, uh, as, as a country, we're going to have to address it as well because, uh, unfortunately, there's just um, this, this this population is 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 really going to be hurt by this. 
but thank you. Yeah. Uh, Ms. I just wanted to add that when we do return, um, part of what was also shared in our communication to families is that everyone is entitled to have a meeting to discuss the impact um, and whether additional services are required um, as a result of that that closure. So um, and the state and we don't assume that everyone's going to need one of those uh, meetings. Um, you know, as I mentioned, 80, over 80% of our students are in inclusion settings in the, um, the first place. Um, so not that everyone's gonna require that, but there is that option, um, you know, to have that meeting to directly assess that and whether there needs to be, they won't be um, changes to the IEP per se, it would be similar to what would be considered compensatory services um, um, in the sense, usually a compensatory service is the failure of the district to provide. But in this instance, obviously it's because we, as you just mentioned, can't always provide it um, given the format. Great, thank you. Okay, um, Dr. Bodhi, was there any other impacts? Uh, I, I did want you to, to mention the, um, the new food program that you've launched and uh, Anything else related to COVID nineteen? Up, oh, you're on. You're on mute. You're right. I'm on mute. Um, yes, we've launched a new food service program. As you remember, when we first uh, closed, we did the grab and go, and Denise Boucher, who is our director of food services, set up a very effective program. After a couple of weeks. Um, we they shifted to having it be a more community-based, but it became very clear that we needed to go back to a, a model where we provided um, lunches and breakfasts. So what has been going on for the last two weeks this week, yeah, the last two weeks, is that we've been delivering a week's worth of lunches and breakfasts to uh, students, any, anyone who's between the ages of zero, well, a, a, a very young child and 18, not zero, but, um, and you do not need to be, have the status of free and reduced. All you need to do is to contact, um, uh, contact the, you can do it through the town, but you can also do it on um, a phone number, which I am going to give you right now, but we are going to make sure that it's on our, um, our website. We've had it on available for teachers, but we need to make sure that it's also available on our website as well as the town. But every week we're increasing the number of students. And the last week we had, I don't know, a high 100s, they went up another 20. Next week we have about 205 students signed up for this. And how it works is that the lunches and breakfasts are prepared at Thompson and we have people on the staff um, of the of the the APS staff that have been delivering these um, bags to different people's homes, and we've had teachers do it, nurses, deans. Um, we've had the transportation department. The, our athletic director has been involved. We've had a lot of people who have given up time to make sure that these get delivered, and I just really want to compliment them all. They've just done an absolutely fantastic job. And uh, obviously successful because it continues to increase. So I, I do want to mention this. I don't know if people are listening that would um, would be the people we would want to be reaching at this hour of the night. But I will give the number. The hotline number is 781-316-3400. And uh, as I said, there is this flyer. I will make sure that it is it's not buried on our website to make sure people have it, but uh, uh, I'm sure you're probably also wondering, how are we funding this? Um, so maybe I'll just let Mr. Mason talk just a minute about how we're funding this program. Yes, um, so just to follow up on the funding portion is that fortunately we are still uh, able to claim reimbursements for the meals that are being served through this wonderful program. Um, so during this time, we typically um, receive about 60% of uh, reimbursement for the cost of this program. The other 40% would come from the actual, the food, the, the food program revolving funds um, and which we have a, a healthy balance to be able to cover 
uh, the expenses to be able to provide the meals. Uh, another thing that uh, I wanted to mention is that uh, the team did a great job on uh, submitting all the documents required to uh, get families in the district uh, PEBT uh, uh, access, which is the pandem pandemic EBT access, which would give families of st uh, students that would be either free or reduced lunch the ability to get access to uh, funds to for meals that they would have missed during the closure closing period, which is equated about five to six dollars per day during this period. Um, so it's, it's pretty good, and I, I'm, I really am glad that we're able to provide uh, these uh, meals for students and able to get students uh, and families some resources that they may need during these difficult times. Great, thank you. And anything else, Dr. Modi, on? Um, well, I think the one of the things that is mentioned here is the issue of fees. And we've had a meeting with the budget subcommittee on fees because um, we collect a, we collect fees um, for instrumental music, for athletic fees, um, for after school programs, daycare, preschool. There's a, quite a quite a bit in our that we we do, and I don't know if you really want to go through specifically um, each one of these of what we're doing, but. Um, for example, athletic fees, we're unfortunately not gonna have our spring season. So we will be refunding all of those fees, but this is gonna take a little bit of time uh, just because of the um, immensity of all this work. Uh, I, I, I'll take your lead, Mr. Cardin, how much you want us to talk about this. Um, I defer to Dr. Allison Ampi, I wasn't there for the end of the meeting. Um, of the budget subcommittee if there's anything that she wants to report the, now or later. I think the main thing that we should let people know is the preschool fees um, and um, that the budget subcommittee took a vote to um, recommend to the um, administration to refund the preschool fees to refund 90% of tuition that was incurred or due after the closure of school in March. So um, we felt that because there is some education going on um, that there was reason to um, maintain a small amount of payment and also thinking kind of looking into the fall and stuff. Um, but we felt that 90% um, seemed like uh, a good number, and that's uh, what we recommended. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Are there any questions from the committee? Don't see any. All right. Can we move on, Dr. Bodie, or is there anything yeah, else? On? That's fine. I, I, there's nothing else that we would report. Okay. All right. The next item is related, is though, is the MCAS update. Um, well, there was a cancel. Uh, <laughs> there, yes, there was a. Well, we all know we don't have MCAS uh, this year for um, our grades three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and ten. But uh, I think of what's really been weighing on everyone is the the issue in the state. I should say, is the competency requirement for seniors to graduate. There are. They have to pass the, the, the MCAS, but they also have to pass a science MCAS as well. And because we were closed in March and we haven't had, a, they wouldn't have a chance to uh, retake the, the uh, test, the Board of Education this week, um, actually it was just the 28th, must have been Tuesday, uh, voted some new guidelines around competency requirements. Essentially, the idea is that, for example, for science, if you can show in a portfolio that you had a course that was equivalent to that, to the science exam that you might have been taking, biology, physics, and physical science, that you could be given credit 
for having passed. So we, Arlington High School is in a very fortunate position that we have one or possibly two students that are in this position and we'll be doing portfolios um, for these students. So that we hope that that will be um, able to be the hurdle that they need to cross to, to have a diploma from the high school. But I thought that was a very wise decision on the part of the Board of Education. Great, thank you. Any questions from the committee? All right. So now is the superintendent's update. All right, uh, a number of things. I, I realize there's a, a certain time, and um, but let me just go through some of these. Some of them will be quick. The the where we are with the high school. Um, I think one of the important things for people to know uh, in the community as well as as on the committee is that the 60% documents were submitted to MSBA. In that process of before submitting them, there's a reconciliation again at this point in terms of the budget. And the very good news is that at this point, um, we are we would have a we would have a 1.2 uh, million that can be used for contingencies. Um, as we go forward. So we're not over budget. Essentially, that's the important message. We're not over budget. And um, that's was very positive because other projects, that's not been the case at this stage. Then um, you're starting to finally see some beginnings of, the, of um, where we are um, in the project, you're gonna see fencing going up at the high school. You've already seen the trees along Mass Ave have fencing around them, um, exterior fencing. So we are in the process of, of setting, the high school is, is definitely beginning. We had um, Board of Selectmen uh, this earlier this week passed the recommendation on tree removal that was submitted and um, had been reviewed and approved by the town warden. So we're moving forward with that. So there will be some trees that are removed from the park area, but that is all part of the, the major plan uh, for the high school. It's also important for people to know that there have been COVID-19 protocols that have been put in place for all workers that are on site, as well as that's been true at Parmeter and, and that's been going pretty well, um, in fact, very well. Um, at parameters. So th those are in place. Um, and uh, the other important piece of news on that is that parameters timeline is um, projected to be on time. So I, I, at this point, we don't anticipate a problem with the preschool um, uh, in the fall of being able to start there at, um, at the at uh, parameter. That's great. And hopefully that stays that way. In terms of, um, I just really want to remind people how important the census is. They've moved the timeline back and, and they're not going to go door to door, but it's really important that people fill out the census, the federal census, because it, it really affects the funding for education. And I guess I'm looking at it from that land, but it has other implications for the state as well in terms of funding in general, as well as our representation um, in Congress. So it's just a reminder about that. And maybe we can just do that every meeting just to remind people that how important this is. We have it on our website, in fact, uh, as a reminder. The other thing I wanted to bring up is that the uh, governor has designated September 14th as a state holiday next year, and that's for the marathon. Um, we still have the Patriots Day, but there's going to be this added holiday uh, in the fall. So what we've done in past years with the Arlington calendar is we've given you um, updates that have happened since January in May uh, to vote uh, the, uh, the school calendar. So we'll just include this day, but I thought you'd want to to know that we're going to be doing that. I don't know if you want to stop it. I have a couple more things. Should I just keep going or do you want to... Sure, yeah. Sure, sure. Yeah. keep going. Um, one of the things that um, 
you know, as we we uh, have been in closure, I think that in all of the all of the what has happened since then, we have not acknowledged uh, some uh, some important things that um, like recognitions that have happened. As you all know, we got to the point where we were right before we were going to have the state championship for ice hockey, um, Arlington High School had been the number one seed in the uh, Super 8. We'd come down to having a, a game on Sunday, but that had to be canceled. So as, as the final designation was that um, Arlington High School were co-state champions this year in ice hockey. But one of the other things that happened after that was that um, John Missouri, who is the coach, um, was, was named the Boston Globe Division 1A Hockey Coach of the Year. And the hockey team, as I said, um, um, was the only team in the Super 8 not to lose a game. Um, the team was named Division I Super 8 State Co-Champions, uh, as I said, because they couldn't play the final game. And in the history of the MIA hockey tournament, with two Super 8, um, what I say? I'm sorry, I'm, I'm having a hard time reading this on the diminished light here. In the history of the MIA hockey tournament to win Super 8 championships, um, we won in, in 2017 and 2020, which is quite an accomplishment. Um, the boys hockey team finished the season ranked number one in the state. So congratulations to the boys hockey team. It's quite an accomplishment and congratulations to John Missouri for uh, being named the hockey coach of the year. Um, so the Boston Globe, the Boston Herald and the Massachusetts Hockey Association boys hockey final record was 19, one and four, and they were the Middlesex League champions as well. Just give me a second, I just turn another light on. The um, other um, acknowledgement we want to give is for Kevin Cummings, who was named the Boston Globe Division II Wrestling Coach of the Year and he was named Division II Sectional Coach of the Year, voted by the coaches in the Division II Metro Wrestling Sectional. Coach Cummings' team this year was the MIAA Division II Sectional Champion for the first time in the school's history. The wrestling team's final record was 25-2, and two, and they also were the Middle, Middlesex League champions. The girls' hockey was also the Middlesex League champions. And um, unfortunately, as you know, the spring season uh, has been canceled. And, and, and of course, one of the things is we feel very badly for the seniors in their last year to have that happen. Another recognition that has come uh, this week, in fact, uh, was for our Director of History Social Studies, Denton Conklin, and this comes from the Massachusetts Council for Social Studies. They are presenting as outstanding educators in the state. And he has been named this year's recipient of the Charles Masako's Outstanding Supervisor Award. And his nomination came from a member of his own department, Melanie Constantakis. So unfortunately that, that would have been a presentation this spring. So it's been deferred till October but I want to congratulate um, Mr. Conklin. We're certainly very, could not be happier that he is part of our um, administrative team and an educator in, in Arlington. Let me just make sure I have gotten everything. Um, one thing you may know, want to know is that May 6th is National Nurses Day. And um, the other thing I was gonna mention, which you've already come up earlier today is that we will have some kind of a forum uh, hopefully next week, um, we're working on some scheduling um, to make that happen. So that is my, um, my report. Great, thank you.
the consent agenda, all items are considered routine and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of the items unless a member of committee so requests in which the item will be considered in its normal sequence. Approval of warrant number 20254 dated 414-2020 in the amount of 1029887.78. Approval of school committee minutes, regular meeting minutes of remote meeting, March 26, 2020. Can I get a motion? I'll move. And a second? Second. A second. Okay, roll call, Mr. Hayner. Aye. Dr. Allison Ampey. Aye. Ms. Seuss? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Mr. Schlickman? Yes. Ms. Morgan? Yes. And I'm also a yes. Okay, the next item is the superintendent search process update. Mr. Schlickman, are you leading that? Uh, I, I just want to note that uh, Mr. Hainer has requested to make a comment on the topic. Yeah. Sure, go ahead, Mr. Hainer. Uh, I think right now, uh, with time the way it is, we have two applicants. Uh, from me, myself reading the two applications, I would recommend that we accept uh, uh, MASC as the uh, search group. Uh, they have a good history. They've uh, they've picked superintendents in the local area, and uh, I think it's uh, for time wise to go forward rather than send this out a second time and probably have the same results. So uh, I, I'm I'm not looking for a motion tonight, possibly for the next meeting, but I'd like us to consider that. Okay, Mr. Uh, Dr. Allison Ampey. Um, I would support this. I've had the same thought myself. Uh, okay. Um, I, I yes, had a functional question. Are we required to um, do a search or can we just provide, can we just assign? I'm sorry, are you asking a, a procurement question for Mr. Mason? Yeah, I think so. Just are we required to? Um, do another, believe, yeah, you can, you can confirm, but I believe we can negotiate with, with one of the bidders. Is that correct, Mr. Mason? Um, technically, uh, you should go through the evaluation process and choose the, the vendor by the evaluation mechanism that we stated in the RFP. So, um, if you decide to waive the interview portion of the uh, of the two vendors, you can do so as, as long as you're not choosing to interview one and not the other. Um, so I believe that you can go through this process and choose one of the two vendors, uh, exempting that part of the criteria for choosing the vendor. But if you, there is the possibility that, um, see, the thing is through doing the RFP, I, I have yet to see the prices because the prices are sealed until the, the group evaluates um, the, the two vendors or the two proposals. You, the, the committee could go and just solicit um, one of the proposals and if it's under 10,000, uh, you can go forward with whatever, whichever vendor. I just do not know what the prices will come in at. They would usually come in probably around 10,000. I've seen that before in my past experience, but I'm not quite sure what MASC would be charging. Does that answer your question, Dr. Altenampi? Ms. Seuss, you're next. Uh, so just, I just wanna point out that the subcommittee has not had a chance to discuss among ourselves what, what and and as, as Mr. Mason pointed out, we have not had a chance to do sort of the formal evaluation process. So I do think we should do that at least. Um, but the second thing is that one of the things that we had briefly talked about last time is the question about whether we should make another request for proposals. It sounds like a lot of people don't want that. That's fine with me. I just wanted to get a sense if there's anyone who felt differently and if they felt differently, why would they feel differently? I think that was one of the reasons we wanted to discuss it. Um, the third point is that we're very close to 10 o'clock. All right, do you wanna make a motion to waive the 10 o'clock rule? 
I make a motion to waive the 10 o'clock roll. Second. Until when? 10.30. Oh. Is that too late? 10.15. 10 10.15. 10.15. We have an executive session, folks. Oh. I know, yeah. Yeah, 10.30. It's going to be 10.30. Second. Uh, okay. Roll call, Mr. Hainer. Yes. Dr. Austin Ampey. Yes. Ms. Seuss. Yes. Mr. Thielman. Yes. Mr. Schlickman. Yes. Ms. Morgan. Yep. So on on the superintendent search, um, I mean, I just I I'd like to go forward. So I'd like to I'd like the committee, the subcommittee, to uh, you know review the bids, make a selection. Uh, I don't think moving from in person. Um, in-person focus groups to possibly online focus groups is, is a substantial enough change to have to restart the process. Um, so I, that's my suggestion. Did anybody else want to comment? Yeah, I, I did, Len. Um, so there's two, just to understand, there's there's two bidders at this point in time. Are you able to share their names? Um, MASC yeah. and Sunshine Enterprises. To to be to be to be quite honest, yeah. Um, I don't think I. I'm just giving you answers to mitigate risk if a vendor was to complain to the attorney general. Um, but I think it would be be very little, since Sunshine Enterprises is based out of Florida. Is being what? Is based out of Florida. Yeah, that's that's the thing. Um, <clears throat> okay. I mean, I think that I think the subcommittee should meet make a recommendation. Um, I mean, at this point, I don't think it's value. I don't think it makes any sense to go back to the market. We went to the market. We only got two vendors. Um, I think that's the market right now for this kind of work. I, I mean, I don't, I don't, I haven't, I'm not as close to this as other people are. So I don't know what other districts have tried to do. Um, and I don't know if other districts have gotten more vendors than we have. If they have, I'd like to know why and how, but that's it. Yes, Mr. Mason. Um, there is one other vendor. They don't typically follow up from RFPs, and they're exempt from um, from the procurement because they're a public agency, which would be uh, the Collins Center at UMass, which they do a lot of these. Uh, they do a lot of searches for executives for public agencies. Uh, Mr. Hainer. How are we to judge them, uh, Mr. Mason, if they don't provide a document? Do we have to reach out to them? Uh, yes, I, I I could reach out to them, but that that's basically a lot of the, those organizations would work that way. You would reach out to them and solicit that or let them know. So when we put out the, the RFP, we put it out in multiple venues, but we didn't actually go and reach out specific vendors. All right. Well, I, may, I, I, I think the subcommittee should try to come to an agreement as to, to how to proceed. Um, I, I any, think any further it's very possible for the subcommittee to come to agreement. Uh, it's just that having a sense of the full committee yeah. is an important part of the yeah. deliberations of the subcommittee. Um, one of the things that was in the original RFP were timelines, which had been blown out of the water in terms of where we anticipated being. Uh, if we didn't go into the COVID situation, we would be in the middle of uh, soliciting uh, community input right now. Yeah. Ms. Morgan? I think all the more reason to try and move forward and, you know, recoup whatever time in that timeline without being, you know, hasty or irresponsible. But, you know, it seems like we should keep moving. I would just Anything like to else? say one other thing is that given the fact that uh, everybody seems to be dead in the water, I think that our selection of candidates uh, at the beginning of next year should be uh, significant we should have a large number of good candidates uh, to choose from all right anything anything else on this 
All right, so we'll go through the um, uh, the subcommittee list. I know that budget met, so Dr. Alessampi, anything you wanna say? No, we discussed fees, which we've already discussed, and we discussed um, this year's budget and next year's budget, and basically we're waiting on further information from the House and stuff um, on those. Yes, there is a budget and revenue uh, task force meeting next Thursday at 8 a.m. Um, so we'll get some sense of what the town is thinking, perhaps. Um, but right now, nothing. There's there's absolutely no information. Nothing we can do. Uh, community relations. Uh, yeah, so we uh, met yesterday and as has already been discussed, there was a discussion about how to do outreach to the community. Um, the agreement was to have a series of meetings, grade level meetings um, with the public. I know that that's under, um, uh, there might be some changes to that. I would urge us to have at least two meetings though, one at the upper and one at the elementary, because I do think the concerns and questions are very different at those levels, um, if, if that's possible, Dr. Reddy. And I mean, Happy to talk more soon. My biggest concern though, is just that it not be pushed too far away, right? I mean, it's gonna take a while to get everyone together and agree to, to meet and, and the format. Um, I still wanna to take too long on this because we are rolling out some pretty big changes and it would be good to hear um, people's questions and answer them very soon. All right, I don't think any other subcommittees uh, Matt, is there any other subcommittee reports? No. How about liaison reports, announcements, or future agenda items? No. Mr. Hainer. Uh, I would just like to have uh, the administration provide any slide presentations to us ahead of time so we can look at them. We had three of them tonight. Uh, one of them was a repeat, uh, but uh, I'd just like to have them available to look through ahead, ahead of time, not try to digest them as they're being presented. Thank you. All right, uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Tuss. Uh, yeah, so one thing we didn't talk about of the survey is the large number of students who um, are maybe having social and emotional sort of worries. I would love to see a presentation by uh, Sarah Bird, both about sort of how parents can help their children with social emotional issues now, but also what next year might look like and what we might be doing as a district to help support people who might be having problems. Okay, we'll consider that. Anybody else? All right, executive session. Uh, to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with union and non-union personnel or contract negotiations with union and or non-union personnel, which if held in open a meeting, they have a detrimental effect. To, get, to conduct strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation, in which if held in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect. Uh, collective bargaining may also be conducted, discuss AEA stipends, and to enter into, into the executive session uh, to comply with a general law, MGL section 268, chapter 268A section 23C2, with regards to EDCO. I get a motion to enter an executive session. So move. Second. Second. Uh, roll call, Mr. Hayner. Aye. Dr. Allison Ampey. Aye. Ms. Seuss. Yes. Mr. Thielman. Yes. Mr. Shipman. Yes. Ms. Morgan. Yes. And I'm yes also. We will not be returning to open session after executive session. <laughs>